Okay, let's go ahead and continue. It looks like we are going to move to 11A. Item 11A is a recommendation to approve the partial releases of a code enforcement liens with an accrued value of $860,230.36 for a payment of $16,623.98 in the code enforcement actions titled Board of County Commissioners versus Tarpon for LLC. Special Magistrate Case Number CEPM2010001861 and CEPM2017007818 relating to property folio number 4068740000001. Collier County, Florida. Mr. James French, your Growth Management and Community Development Department Head is here to present or answer questions. Okay, Mr. French, it's all yours. Good morning, or good afternoon, Commissioners. My apologies. Uh, for the record, my name is Jamie French. I'm the Department Head for Growth Management and Community Development. Uh, commissioners with me today is our Code Enforcement Director, Mike Asario, and we're, uh, we're prepared to answer any questions regarding this case. Um, essentially, uh, in a nutshell, um, our staff on a, on a day in and day out basis with our code enforcement team, they do, they work with the community. The intent is to educate, to drive more towards compliance than the actual enforcement action. Unfortunately, at times, those enforcement actions do take place either in front of your code enforcement board or your office of special magistrate. And Mr. Osario um, certainly has been doing this for better than seven years now in his uh, nearly 30 years with the county. But in this particular case, this property is under the same ownership of a property that uh, was an infraction property in Immokalee. Um, and really the, the bottom line here is, is that when we file a lien under the Florida statute, it encompasses all of the real property that may be under that common ownership. And so what the petitioner is asking for is they're asking for that partial release. And the reason why we lien those properties, all of the properties, it's really a tool for the board to be able to really rectify the issue. This property is tied up. Uh, the, uh, the owner has purchased the property. Um, and our understanding is, is that a title search was not done um, so the transaction's been completed, and, it's, and the lien is just transfers to the new ownership because it's attached to the property. And so what, what the petitioner's asking for is asking for a partial release, and in exchange, what they're willing to do is they're willing to pay the county our hard costs, not the actual reoccurring fine, but the actual hard costs that the county has actually invested into that infraction property out in Immokalee, um, and that, that equates to just a little over $16,000, and that's for things like lot mowing. That's for things like cleaning the property up, uh, demolition of buildings, uh, and those type of, those type of things. But this does not bring that, this does not release that property that actually caused all this, and that, that uh, the Pelican um, Venture uh, Group, that they own several properties in the county, but they sold the property even though it had a lien on it. And again, Mr. Osario and I are, are here to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, I'll open it up with a couple of questions. So, so as I understand it, so the 860, the 860 included a, many more properties that this one person didn't purchase, right? So we're trying to we're trying to um, uh, remove the one piece of property and and, ha and and charge them a fair amount. Right, rather than they, they have to absorb all of it, correct? Am I understanding that correctly? You are correct, sir. In fact, this company has done this before. You've, okay. you've had another property that they sold that the board waived all of the, they removed the lien right. um, and allowed that property to get clear title as well. So, so we don't believe that this pattern of practice is, is, is not is unique. We believe that this property owner will probably do it again. So the properties that are left over, does his 860 go down by 16,000 because 16,000 is being paid for, you know, for the one piece of property? And so he's, he's slowly reducing the overall number. Uh, for the record, Michael Sora, Director of Code Enforcement, uh, that, that number is the hard cost, which is mm -hmm. 860. So that number is, shouldn't fluctuate anymore. Okay. Since the, the, the original code violation in the Immokalee office, uh, we baited. Uh, there might be some weeds or some 
uh, future cost okay. in the future. But as of right now, it's 860 and, and the fines has since ceased. The person paying the 16, was that, you know, when you worked the algorithm, was that like the, the in full amount? And then, we, and then we reduced it, you know, we, we came up with like 16,000 as a fair amount, but if we wouldn't have given any, if we did, but if we, if we did give some sort of discount, you know, if we, if we, if we didn't do that, would it have been a, a much higher amount? It wouldn't have been 860 because it's not all the properties, it's just one. Can you give me a guesstimate as to what it might have been? Well, the 16 is the, uh, Mr. Riznicki is, is offering to, um, settle his partial lease, release of lien on the on his property. Mm -hmm. uh, as the resolution calls for, he's requesting a partial release of lien, and the right. number is he came up with a particular number. Mm -hmm. I came up with a number that satisfies the Immokalee citizens that helps. What number did you come up with? Sixteen thousand. Oh, really? So that it, was just a fluke, or he it just happened the to number? <laughs> I think he actually offered less. And uh, okay. I said, no, I, do, I worked the numbers. Unfortunately, as a director of code, that's the resolution calls for me to do this. <clears throat> and we've done this in the past. And so we look at the, uh, the surrounding neighborhood. It, how do we recoup hard cost dollars from us? Uh, well, oh. I paid for it. I mean, this was a, this Immokalee house was a, uh, a drug house. Right. And so we did some boarding that didn't work. Uh, we worked with the sheriff's office over the years. And finally we took the steps of, we're just going to demo. And so he's paying for all that. Hard cost. But this one is different and unique and, and compared to some of those ones we have that are a little bit more black and white where there's a, and I'll just use these numbers, but this is just a hypothetical. There's an $860,000 lien on one piece of property. That property owner sells it to somebody else so at a discount um, because they're like, oh, you're responsible for 860000 But then that new owner who got the discount then works with us and doesn't pay 860. So, you know, sometimes my concern is when that happens, wow, that person got a, a discount on the property because of this huge lien, but then they negotiated more of a discount with us. But, but that's a little bit of a different example. This one's more complicated with multiple properties, correct? It is. And yeah. your okay. first uh, scenario is, is something we shored up in 2021 with the county attorney's office when Commissioner Saunders basically said, we need to look for uh, windfalls. And we do look for windfalls. I would tell you, uh, over the years, uh, it was a common practice to waiver fines. Uh, but since, you know, the, since I took over, they're far and few between. You can see that the numbers have not, have increased. As a matter of fact, you'll see one, but I deny 10. We'll stick around at the end of this meeting when it comes down to commissioner comments, because one of the things I want to talk about is something that Mr. Kladskow and I have been working on, but I don't want to jump ahead. I, I, I think in that we actually have been waving a lot and giving super duper discounts and being Santa Claus to a lot of people that actually had the money. But that that's that's debatable. And it's a it's more of just some statements I want to make and see what my colleagues think. But um, you've answered my questions. Uh, this one's and, and, and I knew some of that having met with Mr. French yesterday, but just wanted to um, clarify that I that I that I did I did sort of absorb the details on, the, on this one um, correctly. So uh, Commissioner McDaniel and then Commissioner Hall. Yeah, well, my question is: Is how did it? What was our was our code enforcement lien not properly recorded? No, uh, thank you, Commissioner, for the question. Um, so they were recorded, but when you record a lien against the property, based off of your ordinance as well as in, in line with the statute, you record a lien against all of their real property. So it's a it's a wide net you cast that ties up all of their real property so that it, it we believe it's 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 in, in, it's there to encourage the property owner to clear these violations and these fines up okay so we're assuming we waive and accept this settlement payment is there sufficient value in the other properties that are leaned to cover the outstanding Uh, concerning the other properties, I believe that there are 18, and they're all, I believe they're all vacant pieces of property. Unfortunately, this particular company out of, that bought all these 17 uh, bought it as a tax sale, and they quite often they do. This is very unusual tax sale that historically, they will, when they bought this as a tax sale years ago for X amount, five dollars $6,000 on the tax sale, we went in there and we spent a significant amount of money in Immokalee to fix the code violation. Obviously, they didn't cause the violation. They bought the tax sale. Historically, once the lien goes on, we encumbered all the properties this he or she owns, which is a corporation. 
But this fine of 800000 is unique because usually when you buy a tax deed and there's a lien on the property, you don't pay your taxes and we get it back in three years. So you would never see this. We would do the administrative we, the fines, the leases. We would work with the county attorney's office. But this particular corporation has decided to pay the taxes, and so uh, there is no violation except for the lien on the property, which the lien is for 20 years, and, and we're going to work with the property owners, and we still try to reach out to this corporation too as well. Well, C Commissioner, I'm, I'm sorry. Just to answer your question, of the 17 remaining parcels, most likely not. Okay. The value of those properties would not equate to the total amount that's owed to the county on this lien. Okay. Well, and that's a swag, but it's, it's – I understand. I was uh, – you're close enough. I don't have to have specifics at this point. But, the, you know, when you, when you buy a piece of property at a tax sale, you get it as is, where it is, with the attached liens as they are. And, and my concern is that this is going to happen again and again and again and again, and we're going to we're going to the county's going to end up eating uh, this, this exposure. And um, I'm just um, I'm hesitant on these on this. I, I understand what what Mr. Osario has in fact done, but I'm, I'm hesitant on approving this just because the the communication with the with the property owner the previous property owner that actually accumulated the uh, infraction um, is just dishing the property off and, and or allowing it to go for a tax sale and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that so so the property was acquired under a tax sale there were multiple properties, and then this gentleman bought it individually from that property owner that originally acquired it from a tax sale. This was a, a different property, but again, when we file the lien, it goes against all other properties. And this gentleman bought it with title insurance? No, no. I, hmm. I tried to get a quick Come up to the mic. No, I, I tried to get a quick closing, and I for, for went. Uh, title insurance, unfortunately. Can you state your name for the record? Jamie Riznicki. Okay. That was a, obviously a huge mistake. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Commissioner Hall? Or, sir, are you finished? Uh, no? Okay. Yeah, I've got a couple Go of back. questions. Yeah. So, the property that, accu that accumulated all of these fines is not the property that he bought. It's this property that he bought is just attached to it. Is that... Is that, that's correct, sir. It's, it's, it's a vacant parcel okay. that was owned by the same company. So two thoughts. I'm an investor myself. Been in your shoes, been on that side of the podium, and $50,000 later with zero abatement, I had a property. And it was my fault. Where is the buyer beware attitude with the county? Why is it our responsibility to, um, to bail everybody out? When we have ordinances, we have code enforcement, we have fees, there, there's nothing on there that's not illegitimate or it's not uh, excessive. It's been over time since it's been to this, this amount of money. So that's my first, my first question type statement. And then secondly, what is the county's um, what is our privilege with the lien, with the remaining properties? What's our, what's our way out? I mean, can we, can we foreclose and take the property back and then sell the property, each individual lot, or what's our, uh, what's our options? You can foreclose on anything that's not homesteaded. So these are all vacant lots, they're not homesteaded. So the people that sold him the property they're getting they're getting their money they already got their money they got they got their money and they're down the road you know scot free on Mr. Resnitsky's risk you know so i guess to the board is 17 properties that aren't worth the 800,000 we could foreclose on it and get whatever we get out of them and or is or is what is those 17 th 17 properties are they even worth fooling with yeah. 
But I think what we're trying to figure out here is what's fair for him. You know, the remaining properties, right? I mean, that's 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 still in flux. So that's a whole different thing. I guess I should have. You know, I'm going to be on your side. Thank you. So, but as far as going forward, right? And 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 I am more in line with the buyer beware from that perspective. I mean, you made uh, you made a calculated error to buy a piece of property didn't didn't get title insurance didn't do a title search and then you the, you probably went to develop it or build on it and found out that this, this lien was out there so um, I, I, I'm less concerned with you but on the same token it, 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 it it's your responsibility before I go to Commissioner Cole let me just ask you sir a question um, did you move forward with that action because you somehow, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, um, because you somehow knew that the county had a, had a precedence of sort of not being really forceful on liens and things like that? And, um, not at all. Okay. I went, I went ahead with the, with the purchase because I thought it was a good deal. Okay. Did you, did you not know about the liens and the money not, and all that? Okay. Not at all. Okay. So you went into it not thinking, boy, maybe I'll get lucky here. You didn't realize and then found out the penalties afterwards. No clue. Okay. Okay. I would not um, have, would not have went down that avenue if I would have known anything about it. I gotcha. Um, Commissioner Kowal and then Commissioner Saunders, you're on deck, sir. Thank you, Chairman. I, I agree, kind of agree with the Commissioner McDaniel. Um, you know, you do have a due diligence as a purchaser on property. I mean, you know, anybody that invests their own money into something, you know, hoping to, uh, you know, have an investment that pays off you down the road. I mean, that's kind of like on you. You know, I mean, if you were taking money or, or getting loan money, they wouldn't allow you to do this. It would have to be. You'd have to have a title search done, and you would notice up front. But kind of the risk you took is kind of like where we are now. I guess my question for you, uh, Mr. French, is... The problem property that acquired that we've got the eight hundred sixty thousand dollars accumulated over, is that still an issue? As Mr. Osario has indicated that the that it has been abated. Uh, what I've seen looking back within our software application for City View, um, other than lot mowing, um, which we will occasionally do when the uh, when the grasses get above eighteen inches, uh, they're, so they're not maintaining it. The property owner. Okay, so this this LLC to purchase this tax buyout for these lots is right. still not pretty much co you know cooperating or, or doing his due diligence to upkeep the property, and it's still on us. So that's so I knowing his property is not the one that accumulated this, right. but of course the attachment to all properties, real properties, is where we're at. And I guess you know I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I mean if his sixteen thousand whatever plus we foreclose on these other lots and sell them do we get close to what this person owes us because it doesn't sound like he's gonna do anything to to cooperate with us here moving on out so we we would owe you that but based off of uh just our, our quick conversation these are vacant lots typically scattered throughout the estates uh the remaining lots would would probably not total that amount but we can we can uh, provide you what the uh well, at least what the property appraiser says, this unimproved land would be worth, um, even if you provided a, a multiplier for market condition. Um, again, we, we don't think we're going to get close to it. Because there could be wetland determinations, there could be exotic removal, there could be a number of different key factors here that you would be able to pick up one of these lots for you know thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000, depending upon its size. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Saunders? The other 17 lots are still owned by the individual who was responsible for the, the code violation? Did so, they, correctly? so they bought the violation. The violation existed. They bought the property on a tax. On a, on a, okay, so the original bad actor is, is out of the They're property. long gone. They didn't pay their taxes. They went in. This company bought them. And when they bought it, they bought the code enforcement problem. And the $16,000 that we're talking about right now, is that an agreed upon number at this point? So, so what that is, as I was indicating earlier, for lot mowing, any monies that have been ongoing with this property to maintain it, we just put it on that. That's our hard cost currently up against that lien. And so it only becomes a code violation when the lot doesn't get mowed. So this gentleman has not agreed to, to pay the 16000 The 
sorry, the 16,000 has already been paid just okay. to be 100% clear. Okay. So then what we're talking about then is releasing the lien on this particular property because of the payment of the 16,000, which right. I would support doing. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You're, you're not the guy here that uh, created the problem and uh, it looks like you're being punished enough. Yeah. And I, I agreed to, but, to mow the lawn if that's at all, uh, if that would help at all. Uh, <laughs> To abate the issue, I know that's yeah. obviously an issue, and it's going to be well, ongoing. Are there ongoing fien, uh, liens on, or fines on this part? Okay, this, so, this so settles them up. We, we agree with this, and, and he's out of the picture. He pays the sixteen thousand. You still have seventeen lots, um, and I don't know how much money the county is really out of in terms of your your overall cost for all of the eighteen lots that you were dealing with here. How, what was your overall total? Uh, cost to the county. Well, that that would bring us to zero after the sixteen thousand. Those would represent our hard costs that we've put into maintaining that lot, and then the remaining is just the lien. That's not a so that's just the money. So we can we can go ahead and accept this and let this gentleman go home, knowing that his lot is free and clear at this point, and then we can have a conversation about the other seventeen lots. Is that? Fair. And, and that's what's on the executive summary. I know Commissioner LaCastro had mentioned that he had had comments, and we'd love to hear them. I don't know if it's now or later, but that was one of the – within your executive summary, we are seeking guidance because we know that we've got over 700 of these liens that exist out there. So why don't we, why don't we make a motion to accept uh, the 16000 on this particular parcel uh, as settlement of that so that lien will go away so you can go home and – you, know, you you would owe us the sixteen thousand, but that would be the end of it. And then later on, let's have a conversation about the other seventeen lots. Yep. A I'll, second. I'll make that as a motion. Okay. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Okay, we will have that conversation for sure. Um, okay, Ms. Patterson, we're not going to have it here now. Okay, but it's coming. Unless somebody had a question or wanted to belabor it. Because okay. yep. you have to assimilate the data. that yep. you got to get hard costs and so on and so forth. So but. Okay. We're going to 11C? Yeah, yeah, if I may, just before we close yes, out on 11A, I, I think the, the part of the guidance, and we can talk about mm -hmm. it later, is um, that we, we, and we've had this conversation individually, is we see these large dollar lien amounts that represent the accrual of fines and any number of things. Um, is there something we want to do differently than how we've been allowing this to go on 20 years? I'm now understanding we've settled for the hard costs, so the county's not out money, but it does create, um, in some, some cases, a, a perception, a public perception problem that we're just continuing to waive these fines. That's where the staff is looking for. If you're looking to see um, perhaps a report on these once they reach a certain threshold, a certain amount of time where we can give you an update. So we, and we can talk about this at the end of the meeting, but that's why this item actually appeared on the regular agenda was to open that conversation yeah. up a little and let's bit. Let's table that. I, I, I have yep. something prepared that I want to talk about at the end that Mr. Klatskow and I have been working on. And this was a, this was a great example, although this one's a little unique, this one's a little unique, but it, but I'm, I'm glad we did this because it, it put a spotlight and we want to separate rumor from fact. I mean, we didn't just take 860 and erase it away and make it 16. This was a, a piece of a bigger puzzle. But there are examples where there's one thing, one unit, it's 860, and we wash our hands of it by somebody writing a $10,000 check and everybody's fine with it. And that's what we're going to talk about. And, and Mr. Klatsko and I have a little bit of a prepared discussion at the very end when it comes down to commissioner comments. Understood. Um, Item 11C. Okay. Item 11C is a recommendation to accept an update on the status of acquisitions in the already board approved conservation collier land acquisition cycles and multi-parcel projects. Review cycle 11B, proposed conservation collier active acquisition list and direct staff to complete cycle 10 and 11A acquisitions and return to the board in the last quarter of 2023 to consider cycle 11B and potentially cycle 12. Mr. Edward Finn, Deputy County Manager, will begin the presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, I'm going to just uh, have a couple of comments here up front on the um, status of the program and some of the acquisitions. Uh, and Ms. Arake will take over and uh, do her normal presentation for Cycle 11B. Um, so try to provide an update. Uh, where we are right now is uh, in January, the board approved Cycle 10. Cycle 10 was about $17 million uh, in December of 22. The board approved cycle 11A. Uh, that was uh, another $12 million. Uh, in February, uh, today we're looking at a potential 11B cycle. Uh, that cycle is $36 million. 
uh, and that and that is uh, probably most distinguished by a single parcel uh, in the order of magnitude of about $29 million in excess of 7,000 acres. Um, so with this kind of high level of activity or tempo going with the program, uh, we wanted to come forward and uh, provide, provide this status. Um, so just uh, for, for the benefit of the, the newer board members, I'll just uh, cover kind of the, the, broad, the broad swath of the program and where we are. Um, in November of 20, uh, the electors approved uh, the conservation collier millage uh, of up to a quarter of a mil uh, for 10 years to fund conservation collier. Uh, this was the second round of the conservation collier program. Uh, the first round similarly was for 10 years, uh, and that ended uh, with ad valorem collections in FY13. The initial year of the reestablished conservation collier tax levy uh, was FY22. The 22 budget included the tax levy of a quarter mil across the county, and it generated $25, uh, 25 million. The FY23 budget, uh, again, a millage of 0.25, generated 20, uh, a net 29 million net of 5% uh, collection fee. 75% uh, of the collections goes to acquisition, um, and you can see there that uh, about 21.8 in FY23 proceeds, and right now as the budget sits, there's about $30 million available for acquisitions. Uh, in accordance with the statute, 25 percent of the tax levy uh, goes to support ongoing maintenance uh, in a uh, some, somewhat of a almost an escrow uh, where we try to fund the program up with uh, interest earnings on that money. Uh, the intent there is that the program be perpetually funded for management. Uh, certainly, we, we can look at it with the funding we have there, and uh, we're comfortable at a pretty long time. Uh, there's no such thing as perpetual when, when all, all comes right down to it, but it's certainly uh, in the 40 to 50 year range, it's, it's funded. Uh, again, to provide background, uh, a brief financial, uh, financial brief for you covering five years. Uh, the first three years, starting from the left, 19, 20, 21, uh, expenditures, expenditures at the top, sources or, or revenue at the bottom. Uh, you can see that those years were uh, not, uh, there were no taxes levied, there were no ad valorem taxes levied, uh, rather we were operating essentially on carry forward and interest earnings on that carry forward. Uh, there were some land acquisitions during that period. Uh, the board authorized the use of management reserves to fund up those acquisitions in the interim. Uh, those reserves have subsequently been paid back with proceeds uh, in FY22. Um, and uh, if you can see in 22, uh, the ad valorem taxes, uh, again, plug into the financials. And the FY23 budget uh, shows the ad valorem taxes uh, and the other aspects of the revenue down below. And up above, uh, there's two, two major, uh, major budgets there. The first is for land acquisition, and the second is the uh, reserve I mentioned a moment ago that supports maintenance. Um, this is the table uh, that is in your executive summary. Uh, this table uh, is, shows kind of the status of the acquisition uh, cycles on top. Uh, cycle 10, as I said, was $17 million gross. Uh, there were some adjustments, some dropouts, uh, some properties that were rated B that moved to future cycles. Um, there were some acquisitions that have been made to date, leaving available funding uh, order of magnitude $2.5 million out of that cycle still to be covered by the budget. Uh, cycle 11A. Uh, mentioned earlier, about 12.2 million gross. There were some changes, some dropouts, some uh, B B rated properties that that'll move to a future. So that leaves about uh, seven million eight hundred thousand uh, dollars. That's that's still in process. And then finally, 11B, which is the the primary subject of today's presentation, uh, that is uh, best part of 36 million dollars gross. And um, that, that is awaiting board approval so that, so that staff can commence action on that. Uh, funding availability is, is shown towards the bottom. Uh, the, the available budget uh, for acquisition in the current budget is about $30 million. Uh, if the uh, next year's budget is approved as it has been at the full quarter mill, uh, that would generate approximately $21, $21 million in additional funding for acquisitions. Um, and the uh, potential slash pending expenditures column kind of shows how that $46 million in potential expenditures would be covered by the combination of the two years. Um, 
leaving over uh, about five or uh, 5.5 million dollars left over for any properties that subsequently get approved in a in a follow-on cycle, um, and there is a follow-on cycle that is going to follow pretty shortly upon our action today. Uh, that is cycle 12, uh, the size of which we don't know. And uh, this is not going to be very long. I'm I'm going to try to wrap up real quick. Um, one of the uh, key things that that uh, the board discussed in Dece December when they reviewed this. Um, uh, they reviewed both 11A, cycle 11A in, in December, as well as a, a purchase contract for some property on, on Marco Island, and considerable discussion resulted. Um, the discussion revolved around pricing at the appraised amount uh, versus allowing some level of negotiation, uh, disclosure of adjacent property or property owner's interest uh, in the preserved property proposed to be acquired, uh, and creating a little more clarity in our appraisal reports uh, relative to uh, the impairment or the, the deductions made, for instance, for gopher tortoises on the property or other uh, environmental impairments. So staff has taken, uh, made adjustments to all of those things. Uh, so the uh, appraisals will be pre presented in a slightly different fashion to put those items right up front. The uh, additional uh, disclosures have been added to the application process uh, so uh, abutting properties that have an interest will be disclosing that. And uh, we've re-engaged uh, with the sellers to determine if they would entertain uh, some level of price, price adjustment. Uh, so the slide you're looking at here are from uh, cycle 10. Uh, these are properties that uh, we had, generally speaking, uh, reached some level of price agreement in a contract with these, uh, these folks, uh, given the board's direction. Uh, we thought it prudent to reach out to them and, and entertain a little more discussion. Uh, you'll see from this that of the uh, accepting the number 17 property at the bottom, of those 16 properties, uh, 11 of them have accepted some, some negotiated adjustment um, to account for either changes in market or uh, perhaps just simply being asked if they would take a lower amount. So that's, uh, those will be returning to the board. Um, some of the properties, of course, did not did not want to entertain some pricing adjustments. Um, I believe it's our intent at this point in time to uh, proceed with those as they were and present those to the board for approval. Um, this slide is uh, additional cycle 10 properties uh, that staff uh, will be also contacting property owners to finalize. They're in a different, different state of contract readiness, which is why they're on a slightly different slide. Um, uh, Ms. Araki will be discussing this. This is the cycle 11B properties. Um, these are the properties that have actually been closed relative to cycle 10, and the closing dates and the board approved dates are shown there in the uh, two right-hand columns. And one more eye chart type slide. Uh, these are board approved properties for closing with an estimated uh, closing date. So if, I, if uh, indulge me for one second, I'll, I'll attempt the summary. Um, uh, uh, staff has uh, uh, staff had, has forced or requested the disclosures uh, from people applying to the to the uh, program um, and the pricing approach to allow negotiations from the appraised value. As cycle 11B and future cycles are approved, we're recommending uh, maintaining reasonable balance uh, between the approved uh, acquisition cycles and the available budget. Uh, I think what we have now, this, the overlap to 24, uh, is not uh, on its face unreasonable. Uh, I think the actual timing is probably going to allow us to move forward with that. Uh, but as these additional cycles pile on, we're a little concerned that the pipeline is going to become overfill, overfilled uh, and the expectations perhaps uh, can't be met with the timing that we're going to actually move forward with. Um, the other kind of key thing is uh, staff is going, moving forward is going to seek to shield the appraisals from the uh, process, um, allowing those appraisals to be reviewed after the negotiations are done, uh, but that would be our, our desire to facilitate um, coming off of the, uh, the full appraised amount. Um, and I want to make it, it's kind of important for me to say that staff always proceeds in good faith, um, and we certainly want to want to meet all the objectives of the program and, and have a successful program. Um, but at the end of the day, these decisions are the board's decisions, not, not, uh, not staff's decision. Uh, and the last thing I'll mention is cycle 12 um, is going to follow somewhat hard upon this. 
Um, I, I haven't met with the county manager to determine exactly what that schedule will be, but there is another cycle that is going to be coming at you very shortly. Um, with that, if there are no questions, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Rock. Oh, no, there's questions. There's um, questions. I'm going to ask you a couple, and then uh, Commissioner McDaniel and Commissioner Hall are lit up, and then we have public comment. So I don't know if we we'll, – we'll hear from the commissioners, and then we'll go to public comment. Um, if you can go back to slide four. So on um, – on cycle 10, so we've we've purchased and acquired the vast majority of the properties. Is that a true statement? Um, uh, let me explain it this way. Um, the acquired to date is actually the column that has 3.5 million in it. Yeah, so that, that that's smaller than I would expect. But then you had some other slides that showed cycle 10, and it looked like the people had agreed, and yes, 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 yes. So we didn't acquire it, but it's in the final stages? or Those, those actions took place subsequent to your December uh, December meeting on this subject mm -hmm. so that's the process that staff has moved forward with since December is recontacting those property owners and adjusting uh, adjusting for current pricing on those properties okay. I'm just gonna say two more things and then and there'll be more once we hear public comment and I want to hear from my colleagues but um, <laughs> You know, a couple things, uh, and Jamie Cook will love this. It, this reminds me of like the rock crushing lot. Um, we're, we're moving so forward on cycle 10, 11A, 11B, 12, 13, 14, 15. Are we buying? I mean, we need to, we need to purchase as, as, and not delay in the purchases as quickly as we're identifying. So like on the rock crushing lot, they're bringing in a billion tons of rock and we're crushing three pounds a day. I mean, it feels that way. So somebody tell me that, that it's not right, but bringing all these lists is great. So we're doing the exploratory work and we're finding out where these environmentally sensitive properties are. But gosh, you know, I'm seeing dates on here that, you know, um, we, these lists came before us. We approved the, the, the priority list. And, um, you know, now we're, we still and, 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 and I'm looking for an eloquent answer. Hey, we're not stalling on these and it takes time, commissioner and all that. And then, you know, maybe, maybe that has merit and maybe it doesn't. The second thing mm -hmm. is. I like the negotiation part, but I said this to, to, to Ms. Patterson yesterday, you know, part of that discussion that we led here was for those unique circumstances where, and I gave the example of somebody owns a $50 million house next to one of these lots, the lot is appraised for $20 million, but they get a huge benefit by us paying full market value, and then they get a, they get a basically a, a preserved state park next to their property for the rest of eternity and, and get, you know, their sunset view is never blocked, and they never have renters next to them. I would... I would think that was a really great example for negotiation. I do like that, you know, we're not just sort of saying, hey, this is the appraised value um, uh, and, and, and we pay it, you know, you know, blindly. I like the negotiation piece, but also too, I don't, I don't think it was the intent of the board at all to say, oh, we're no longer paying face value. We're gonna negotiate any, everything. Um, that's not a hor horrible thing, but I also don't want to, run the risk of possibly losing a lot that has significant environmental value over a, a haggling of $1,400. And so I don't know if somebody took our um, our direction on, on adding some verbiage that would allow negotiation. And we were very specific here in those very unique circumstances where we don't want to be taken advantage of as a county. And, and also, too, the, the additional money saved allows us to, to maybe buy additional things. So no haggling. We pay face value. We buy 10 lots a year. A little bit of haggling. Maybe we, we acquire 13, you know, with the savings. So these are more of statements, but, um, and I think we're going we're gonna to circle back. But I just feel like we're getting all these, all these lists of how about this, how about this, how about this. And, you know, I want to know we're, we're buying these things or not. Or not. And it seems like we, we're, kind of, we're kind of stalling a little bit. We're, we're racing on the proposed list. But I don't see the, the purchasing sort of catching up to the, to the nominating. But if I'm wrong, that's what I want to hear. I might be summarizing this totally incorrectly. And all the experts are here. So I'll just leave that. I don't, think, I don't even think it requires an answer because I think, you know, and it's, it's, it's more of just a statement. Let me go to, um, I'm, I want to hear once from all the commissioners that are lit up and then, and then let's go to public comment because I, I think that'll definitely add. And if you're a, a commissioner that's lit up and you'd rather hear from cover, public comment, then let me know. Commissioner McDaniel? I'd rather hear from the county manager first. That okay. <laughs> she's over there okay. leaning. She's waving her hand. Like, she's yeah, waving her she's hand. She's been over there <laughs> throwing stuff at you. She's not lit up. Miss <laughs> 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 Patterson? Uh, so, Commissioner, I think part of why this might 
feel a little bit different. So we probably should have mentioned that we used to have an annual acquisition cycle. So you would see this once a year and then things would go on behind the scenes before you saw another list. Um, going back in a little bit of time, probably back to the summer period, um, we went to a quarterly acquisition cycle. So now you're seeing these with more frequency. So that's the first thing that maybe is seeming this to compress and is one of the reasons that we wanted to bring this update to you so that we could position where we are in these cycles and get you some perspective on what's going on. Not that we're trying, things Things move slowly sometimes. We, we know that government's not the speediest entity. Um, however, we're not artificially dragging our feet or trying to slow things down. Um, as far as the as far as the negotiations or the haggling, really, I think um, the, the staff did a great job at, at my direction at looking at everything that we had in our basket that you hadn't approved, looked at what, what reasonable reliances property owners had on us, as well as changing market conditions, as well as those other factors that we talked a lot about, be that listed species or other environmental factors on the property, and tried to find some balance to meet the board's objective that we don't just write a check for an amount with no questions, but we're not trying to unreasonably haggle with people. So I, I, th I think you can rest <clears throat> assured. And if people, we had a case, uh, not naming names, where a property owner said, I wasn't that happy with the appraisal, but I agreed to it. They weren't willing to talk any more about it, and that's okay, and those will come back to you. And so we wanna be sure that the message that gets out in this, no matter where we go from here, is that when staff is out, doing this due diligence, talking with the property owners, the final action still rests with the board. It's not, staff can't do this. We don't, we can't promise anything. We can, we can execute board's direction and move board's policy. But in the end, those contracts are between the board and the property owner. So things sometimes change. And we wanna make sure that property owners understand that we're gonna try to, we're gonna carry the ball. But you could say no to one, all, half, and that is absolutely your prerogative. Um, so that's, that's, okay, perfect. that's clarification. Okay, makes sense. Uh, Commissioner McDaniel. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, what are we buying today? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, um, you said it way better than I did. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you it. that's all. That, that was that was it. That's what are we buying today? That's my first question. <laughs> properties lined up are shown on your screen. So we're we're going. And this, and this set of properties is also ready to go. And that's all on ten. Uh, that was right. ten. Okay. Right. right, sir. And and that then leads into. Your beginning statement, because I was over here feverish, feverishly writing on the numbers, and you said cycle 10, cycle 11A, cycle 11B, and, and my notes said it was 17 million in 10, 12 in 11A, and uh, 36. 36 in 11B, which total up to 55 million plus minus, and so. It, one of the things that, that I want to clarify here is, first off, we have to be careful that we don't lean out over our skis and commit to, uh, and I understand we haven't made an acquisition on anything at all until it goes through the entire process, the appraisals and negotiations, the contract, and, and then comes back to this board. So we're not ever going to, even if, even if this list that you now have up here, 10, uh, you know, e even if this list with 12 that you say is fast coming upon us, it blossoms up to uh, 100 million. We're not going to exceed the available funds that we have ever. We 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 just can't do that. We don't, and certainly don't want to put the board in a position where, because we set this millage rate, the 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 way the question was worded was up 2.25. And that if a board, a future board chooses to adjust that rate in the future, that that number could be could be less than the 0.25. So, um, so so my first question was, how much are we spending today? And then how how far along are we on? Because if, if if my math is correct, and these numbers that are out here, you're going to be about five million of the 17 million that was given to us back for 17 or for cycle 10. And so that, that leaves 10 million left of uh, yes, approved sir. acquisitions. Yes, sir. The uh, acquisition still moving their way through prior to the board considering 11B is order of magnitude is $10 million. The current budget supported by cash in the, in the fund is $30 million presently. 
So today we're going to buy a, a, a on the previous the previous two slides about 1.3. We're going to we we can approve those yes. as yes. as brought forward. Yes, sir. Okay. Commissioner Hall, and then Commissioner Cole. Um, Mr. Finn. So we haven't purchased cycle. The way that chart four looks to me is we have 2.4 million in the bank ready to spend left. Uh, that is, yes, for all intents and purposes. Rather, uh, I think I'd prefer to look at those numbers as the properties that are teed up for us to purchase moving forward. So when we get cycle 10 finished, how much money are we going to have left in cycle 10? Cycle 10, we will have uh, 20. Seven five available twenty seven million five hundred thousand available in our budget. Okay. So, uh, it, and if I may. So if we go forward with eleven A. Yes, we will have twenty million still in hand in the budget. So that's for fiscal year twenty three. That is for fiscal year twenty three. So cycle eleven B that's including the hammock owl deal, that couldn't be purchased until next year. Fiscal year 24? Uh, some of it could. Um, the, remember, it's, uh, it's $36,000 in total properties, and, and some will cover the specifics of that. Uh, one property is 29, uh, and that property owner has expressed a, a willingness to staff and in public to negotiate the terms and the timing of that, of that particular uh, acquisition. The so, editorial is 36 million, not 36,000. 36 million. 36 oh. million in cycle. 11. Recommended. Did you negotiate it down to 36,000? Uh, wow. I, you I are spelled that amazing. One. I spelled yeah. that one. Sold. Get that guy <laughs> and so, secondly, on the negotiations, and I think uh, county manager may have answered it, are we talking to these individually owners or are we sending them like a blank? Would you be willing to give up 10% okay. letter? We're speaking to them on the phone and we're working through it like person to person, something of a relationship Good. With, with the property owners. Good. They even did that on the on the actual and and again staffs per, and forgive me for jumping in but they they actual negotiated contracts they went back to those people that were negotiated contracts still pending board approval because they're not done until we right. say go um, they they even went back to the ones that were preview that the other list that he had up there there was fourteen hundred twenty five hundred so on and so forth that that folks agreed to a reduction in their sale price. On, on those contracts on the precept that it's not a done deal to the board approves her. Going forward, this should be a little smoother because we're going to be negotiating in advance before we get to a contractual arrangement pending uh, board approval. It should, the, the negotiation should be a little smoother. And known by, by agreed perspective. Um, can I go to Commissioner Cole or you're done? Sure, go ahead. Hey, Commissioner Cole, and then I'm going to go to Commissioner Saunders. So we've all at least spoken once, and then we'll go to public comment. Commissioner Thank you, Cole. Chairman. I just, I know we talked about the frequency and where we were before quarterly and then down to two a year. I've been here three months, and I think you're telling me I'm going to find my third one in front of me here really soon. So I don't know where we're at now with this quarterly and, you know, what, because I just don't want to. Listen, I applaud you guys because when I heard 11 out of 15 accepted our negotiation, you know, I think, in, in, you know, in a way that I think that's a win. And I think that shows what we, we talked about here that, you know, it can be done and we don't have to pay to market value. So and that doesn't mean the other four won't come around or we won't actually find the need to purchase them at market value. So I think that shows that we did save a little bit of money, and, you know, a little bit of work we did in a few months. Um, but I just don't want to get this impression to the, 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 you know, the citizens out there that, you know, we just keep approving these lists, approving these lists, and we're, we're approving lists that we can't even really vouch for how we're going to pay for them in the future. You know, I just don't want to, it's, it's a visual thing of it. So, you know, and like I said, I'm going to see my third list here, and I've only been here three months. So I, and if, if, it's just, if I may, Mr. Chairman, um, and that was a little bit of our concern is, is we saw the tempo of this picking up and we just wanted to make sure the board had an opportunity to see all of this. Um, the, the actual schedule now is two cycles per year. Okay. So they've adjusted that kind of acknowledging that the, the pipeline was getting, a, had the potential to get overfilled. Um, so, you know, one of the key things that, that we're kind of striving for here 
uh, and I probably should mention, I'll play this off for the county manager's comments, is we want to maintain the appropriate backlog of properties. We don't want to have such a backlog that it's, it's creating expectations that we can't achieve, um, but we want, we need to have something backlogged so that the program can be effective, so the processes of procurement can happen in a timely fashion. So we, we need to just find that middle ground, and that's part of why I'm having this discussion with you today. Thank you. So you're Commissioner Saunders. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to wait to uh, reserve my comments until after the speakers. Okay. All right, let's go to public speakers, Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, we have six registered speakers today. Your first speaker is Michelle Leonard. She'll be followed by Patrick Utter. I would encourage our speakers to queue up at both podiums. Good afternoon, Commissioner. I'm Michelle Lenhard at 1442 Galleon. I've met some of you personally. I'm the new chair of Conservation Collier, so I will get to the rest of you that I haven't met one-on-one -on -one with yet. Um, so in um, relation to the agenda items before you today, um, I wanted to say that we would encourage you, the CLAC, to accept the updated status and approval of acquisitions and so we can complete Cycle 10 and 11A, um, which has been, been presented to you. I would actually ask you to also review Cycle 11B today, um, which is the active acquisition list for Cycle 11B, and approve um, those properties that you feel, you know, hopefully approve CLAC's recommendations on those properties or properties you feel merit looking at in a different way, but that we move forward on Cycle 11B today. And then I want to address this timeline conversation that we're having. Um, from CLAC's perspective, um, which some has been brought up today in, in an executive summary. Um, I would say CLAC, as well as property applicants and the public, have been um, operating under, under the direction of the Commission to accelerate the acquisition process to meet the increasing market demands that we're all seeing in the area. On April 26 of 22, a request was made by your board to Conservation Collier to look for ways to accelerate the timeline. The board approved those recommendations on July 12th of 2022, and then revised it post-Hurricane Ian on December 13th, 2022. The, recommend, the recommendation to move the ranking to the last quarter, whoops, I think I missed my line here, hold on. <laughs> um, the established timeline would have Cycle 11B ranked January or February, which is where we are at today. Okay, um, and that is a, we, we initially did see, as has been mentioned, a quarterly recommendation, but your final approval was for two cycles a year, meaning that that pipeline would get overfilled and that we should backtrack to two a year. But this would sort of balance, right, the market demand and, and time frame of staff, et cetera. So um, the recommendation to move the ranking to the last quarter of 2023 in CLAC's opinion is contrary to a decision you made just two months ago. Oh, sorry, I thought you were, you looked like you were going to ask me something. I'm, I'm going to eventually. Okay. So um, to move the ranking, so something that was decided two months ago, now we're saying should be moved to the end of 2023. And that seems to me very close on the heels of a decision that was kind of just made. Property owners will be especially impacted by this delay and we may lose the opportunity to purchase property that we intended to. So I encourage you to move forward with Cycle 11B today, the active acquisition list. Cycle 12A will come before the board. It's scheduled for September. So if CLAC moves at the current schedule that we're working under, you would see that list in September. Um, that would be Cycle 12. And we would work forward, you know, whatever deadlines you give us, we will adjust to, but that's currently how we would operate. And we encourage you to stick to this proposed timeline for Cycle 11B and Cycle 12. Commissioner Saunders, you have a question? Yes. Uh, can you kind of articulate for me what the uh, committee wants us to do today? This is a little bit confusing. There's uh, been a lot of cycles yeah. thrown out here today, okay, and so I have to say I'm a little confused. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's not just me, but I, I just want to know exactly what you would like us to do today. My understanding was that, that we were going to be requested to approve Cycle 11B today uh, and that there may be some confusion as to whether this is going to be continued. But I was prepared to support acquisition of Cycle 11B 
today. Is that what? Well, my my thoughts initially was that that was happening today, but when I read the wording of the what agenda asking, item, what I'm asking, I would recommend that you approve cycle 11B today. What, what I'm asking is just what does this committee want us to do today? Now you're saying that the committee wants us to acquire cycle 11B. Correct. Move, move, to approve it, the active acquisition move, life for cycle 11B. Move it okay. forward. What about the um, it, it, the other cycles that have been mentioned today, cycle 10, cycle 11A. Well, as you've already approved the active acquisition list for those properties, I was encouraging you to support staff's recommendation and, and move and continue to purchase those properties. Okay, so we don't need to take any action on, on those today. Cause I don't believe you do, but I think staff would advise you on that. Okay. So then the, the committee would want us to continue with cycle 10, 11A, and 11B today correct okay and that's what I was prepared to do this morning or this afternoon so just needed some clarification and then Thank my you. further comment was to maintain cycle 12 on the current schedule um, so and the final point I have is not actually relating to the schedules but sort of relates to your budget discussion so when you approve an active acquisition list we're actually recommending that you approve the a listed properties if there's a B-list property that is of interest to the board, then we would encourage you to move it up to the A-list. But if you also approve the B-listed properties, you're actually tying up your budget. But we didn't okay. do that in the past. We did it, and like I said, you're new to the position. At least my recollection is that's exactly what we did do. We saw properties on the B list that some of us thought should be on the A, and that was part of our our motion. But you know, I, I will just say, you know, and 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 I, I don't. I mean, this in a very very respectful way. But like you said, you know, we're all a little bit confused. We need you to be the least confused because you're leading Conservation Collier. So it's great that we all got emails from a thousand residents that all said, "Stop delaying. Stop doing this." Nobody here is doing any of that. What we want is somebody to come up here, show us a list, and explain to us what, how you want us to spend the money. Um, so 99% of the work and heavy lifting is done by your organization and the county staff. We're here as the final approval authority. So somebody needs to come here with complete clarity and explain to the five of us exactly like Commissioner McDaniel said, what are we buying today? Um, so. I, you know, whether it's quarterly or twice a year, I don't think anybody up here is going to debate for five hours. What we want is clarity, and we will make the final decision. And um, and in the two years I've been in the seat, there, there were several properties in, on the B list in my district that I, I lobbied hard for to move up to A, and my colleagues agreed. So we know that we have the latitude to shuffle. Where I just get concerned is what what I said at the beginning is that we're moving deep into all these cycles but I, I want to be purchasing or not as quick as we're also being offered things because like Commissioner McDaniel said he said perfectly we get out ahead of our skis and we're sitting sitting here saying yes 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 we might be overspending um, the money back that we actually don't have so nobody's here delaying anything but if someone feels they have that perception um, you are the one person and working with the county staff that can come to the podium and clear that perception. So um, it, it's it's not um, it doesn't My look like you know. you're not getting out over your skis because mm -hmm. county staff keeps it all in order for you in terms of acquisition cycles and what we're recommending and where your budgeting is. Okay. PLAC is not doesn't have purchasing authority. We only review properties and nominations of properties and recommend to you what we feel meets the ordinance. But you bringing it to us in, with a with a, a, a clear a list, ranking, correct. a clear ranking, and also too, you know, before we sit here and, you know, I'll say yay to list 12, I want to know what the heck happened to list 10 um, oh, we, that we approved a year ago or, right. you know, a year and a half ago, and we, there's still a couple of properties lingering on there. So I want somebody with some, you know, uh, uh, eloquence to come up and say, well, there's a coup, two properties that are sitting out there. We're not delaying. We're not lagging or the property owner changed their mind or or, you know, those that kind of clarity, you know, would help us um, here. April, well, April. we see that also. Th there's follow-up to CLAC on each acquisition list, and we can see what offers were not accepted. Um, but that takes time because the process sure. has to go through. Okay. Commissioner um, McDaniel? Well, I was just going to say April will clear all that up when we get to her. Yeah. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Okay. Thank we'll you go to the next much. public speaker. Thank you. Your next speaker is Patrick Utter. He'll be followed by Brad Cornell. For the record, Patrick Utter. I'm Senior Vice President of Collier Enterprises. I'm here to discuss Al Hammock, and uh, in my primary uh, comment, I just wanted to assure the board that if 
if Al Hammock gets approved to go forward to the next step, which is the appraisal process, that uh, Collier Enterprises would entertain uh, a staged takedown, likely a takedown, but a delayed payment over two years is what I've been um, authorized to uh, let you know at this point. But it, you know, obviously it's going to depend on the appraised value as well. So, and beyond that, I know the staff has a very thorough report, and I'll be here to answer any specific questions if you might have any. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Great. Thank you. Your next speaker is Brad Cornell. He'll be followed by Gary or Jerry Manning. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Brad Cornell, and I'm here on behalf of Audubon Western Everglades in Audubon, Florida, and appreciate the opportunity to address uh, Conservation Collier Cycle 11B. Um, my first comment is just to uh, emphasize our view that there should be no delay in consideration of Cycle 11B. It's been fully vetted um, with all the inspection reports and the data to support that from your staff and your advisory board and um, with a detailed ranking so it's ready to discuss and vote today. So we urge you to do that. Um, this list is um, to be followed by Cycle 12, which um, Michelle pointed out isn't going to be heard by you until the end of September of this fall. And then the next one, 12B, isn't until m the end of March of 2024. So this is not piling on super fast. I think you're going to have the ability and staff will have the ability to vet and process and pursue the acquisition process appropriately. Um, I do want to emphasize that if, if there were a delay, it's really important to remember that's going to undermine the process that people understood existed in conservation colliers. So it, it makes it difficult to attract future applicants to sell property to the, to the county. So that's a, a really important facet of, of keeping moving and, and pr approving this cycle today. That cycle has some really important um, properties on it. There's a 14-acre parcel with swallow-tailed kite roost uh, included on it, really near Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. There's 273 acres of Florida panther habitat on several different parcels that also has water resource value. And, and there's also an addition to the very first conservation collier preserve, which was Otter Mound on, on Marco Island back in like 2003 or four, somewhere in there. So there's an addition to that. And then the Owl Hammock parcel over 7,300 acres that's in the area of critical state concern, the Ocalloway Coochie Slough, and it, it's adjacent to a strategic panther roadkill location at that bend in State Road 29. Lots of panthers have been killed there. In order to get FDOT to put an underpass on, under that, we need to permanently protect land on both sides. This is one way to get that. And I'll also point out that when you buy the land, those 7,300 acres, you're retiring the credits and the ability to build additional towns and villages with those credits. So you're reducing that development potential. Um, there's also, it's also really important to remember you've got um, multiple parcel, multi-parcel projects. The, the, um, the Panther Walk Horse Pen Strand in North Golden Gate Estates is an important one to rehydrate to help protect Golden Gate Estates from catastrophic wildfire, which is going to be happening more and more. So we urge you to move forward with an excellent um, list on Cycle 11B. Thank you very so much. Let me ask you this, Mr. Cornell. So I, uh, I agree with you that, you know, 11B, we all studied the list, so we, we, we understand it. But um, do you have concern that there's been, do you feel like the um, list 10 and 11A have been stalled on as far as purchase? So it just, I, you know, there again, I sort of reiterate without oversimplifying, it's great to see these new lists come up and all the education on how important they are, but why aren't we buying things faster off of 10 and 11A? Or should we not be concerned because they're moving at, at, a, at a good rate and it's just a perception? I mean, I, I would have been more impressed getting emails from citizens saying, please don't delay on buying lists that are that are starting to gather dust before you approve something brand new today do both but um do you have concern that list 10 a, 10 and 11a are, are are getting a little bit dusty or um what's my, your my understanding is that your staff have been pursuing the acquisition process fully okay um, there was a pause that was put on to go back and look at those parcels again i don't know what influence in terms of timing that may have had you heard your staff um, talk about that this morning. Uh, 
Um, I, I have full faith and trust in your staff to, to pursue those, those acquisitions appropriately, and I, I think that's you know, just a reflection. We had a little hurricane in the midst of all this that has you know, thrown a, a wrench in all kinds of works. I don't have um, any concerns that, okay. that your staff can, can pursue these adequately, and I think now with only two cycles, per year, I think that the capacity has been uh, shown to, to be there, and your funding capacity, especially with the willingness of the large parcel from Color Enterprises, the Al Hammock, to be phased, I think you've got the, the capacity to, to address all of these. I just once. want to make sure whoever came to the podium for Cycle 10 and 11A gets the respect they deserve, because people sat there when, when Cycle 10 and 11 was up and told us how these were critical properties and, you know, and I just want to make sure they're not lagging in purchase and you know we're not getting out like you said ahead of ourselves and we're identifying all these new parcels but we've got some that are sort of sitting and then you know you get the ability of a property owner to change their mind or property values to change but um, I appreciate your answer so we'll keep going with public comment okay agreed you, and sir perhaps you you want to get a, a regular report from your staff so that you know everybody can have a scorecard to understand where the process is but but I, I'm confident that they're they're doing a great job great thanks thanks Brad. your next speaker is Jerry Manning he'll be followed by Brittany Piersma uh, hello I'm Jerry Manning I live at 7399 Monteverde Way in Naples uh, I'm here as a private citizen a semi-retired businessman with considerable experience in small-scale mining in South Australia Having dealt with the environmental regulations there, which are far more stringent than they are here, I'm familiar with some of the similarities in uh, land use vis-a-vis -vis water uh, issues and other resource protections and controls. Having said this, <clears throat> I'd urge you to vote today in favor of the Cycle 11B and A recommended properties, including the swallow-tailed kite roost parcel near CSS and the large 7,300-plus acre owl hammock parcel. As a member of the Corkscrew Sustainability Board and a significant uh, contributor to the Florida Audubon, I endorse the need to keep open space and wild habitat for now and for future generations. I applaud the support shown thus far by our elected officials to set aside these properties, and I, along with three of every four voters in our state and county elections, am eager to see a favorable vote by the commission today. Thank you for permitting me to speak to you today. And just one point, if you ever really want a lesson on regulation in mining, schedule a meeting. All right, let's do it. <laughs> Your next speaker is Brittany Piersma. She'll be followed by Meredith Budd. Hi, Brittany Piersma, field biologist for Audubon Western Everglades. Um, I'm here to focus mainly on being the voice of Marco Island since I work there more than anything else. But um, I give a lot of presentations this time of year. This is season. And I highly promote to everyone all the work that county staff uh, and the board is doing for this Conservation Collier program. So everyone is very excited about a lot of the properties, um, especially on Marco Island. Um, yes, Marco Island is a very urban area. Um, but I, I don't want that to fault you in thinking that we don't have an immense amount of wildlife in that area. Obviously, I've mentioned that we have over a thousand tortoises on the island, um, but they are facing a lot of threats. So having the linkage of these properties and showing that they have areas to feed and roam uh, and limit the roadways that they're going to come across is really vital to this area. Um, as I mentioned, these Marco citizens are so excited. Uh, from the past properties in 11A um, to now even looking at properties with the one adjacent in 11B to Otter Mound, um, this is just going to continue with not only the conservation within these linkages, but it's promoting more of a concept of having people now change their front yards. Uh, they see these tortoises that are living next door, and we are trying to promote a campaign to have people create native plants in their front yards. Uh, you may be aware of our Burying owl program, uh, that's where we have starter burrows in the front yards that we're attracting burying owls to live in front yards. Same thing is happening for tortoises. So I don't want you to just think of it as we're saving these little plots of land and these tortoises are all confined in these areas. The Marco citizens are extremely supportive of this. They want to create these linkages and ensure that we can really protect them in the area. Along with that, um, really exciting news, we actually have BBC, if you're not familiar with BBC, a British film company. They're in town right now, and they are filming a documentary on the Americas. 
they specifically chose Marco Island because of its wildlife. So from the marine life to the tortoises to the burying owls, their main focus right now is the burying owls. Um, they chose this area as a part of their whole 10 series documentary. Um, they've been spending time with us over the last two weeks. Um, so just to show that Marco is very unique um, and there's people from all over that are really hoping to increase the conservation in our area. Um, and last note, um, I'm sure you've seen that after the hurricane there was uh, immense effects to a lot of the tortoises that were living in Naples coastal dune areas. Um, it's good to say that on Marco Island, I'd say 90% of that population had minimal to no effects from that hurricane because of the immense areas that they have that's this upland habitat that's suitable for them to be able to survive. Um, so most of them didn't even have water come near their properties whatsoever. So important to think going forward, but thank you so much and, and I look forward to coming back talking more about these properties. Mr. Chairman, just, just for the record, I'd like it to be noted that Brittany supports uh, density increases on Marco Island for turtles. <laughs> I don't know. She dug a burrowing owl hole in my yard. I still don't have anything. <laughs> your, your next speaker is Meredith Budd. She'll be followed on Zoom by Oscar Anderson. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Meredith Budd, and I am here today as a resident of Collier County, Golden Gate Estates. I have been working in the environmental field in Southwest Florida for the last decade, and specifically on local land issues here in Collier County in a professional capacity. I'm here today to emphasize the importance of moving forward, completing cycle 10 and 11A, and moving forward with the process for 11B. All of the parcels that are up for consideration are added value to the Conservation Collier Program, and I want to explain what I mean by that because each of these parcels before you for 11B are actually adjacent to existing conservation lands. The conservation lands on much of these parcels that are adjacent are actual Conservation Collier lands like Nancy Payton Preserve, expanding that preserve, the Gore Preserve. So expanding upon the investments you already have here in Collier County. Others uh, are adjacent to crew like the Brewer Parcel um, and Owl Hammock is adjacent to, I believe it's a mitigation area, but it's marked on a, in a green conservation managed area on the maps provided. So every single parcel in 11B is an addition to existing conservation land that's being managed as conservation. So that's an added value to the to the program. I'll slow down. Yes. <laughs> um, and I also just want to echo um, uh, support for specifically the Owl Hammock piece. Um, Collier County is one of the few counties throughout the state, all 67 counties, one of few that actually have a local land acquisition program. And the state does have land acquisition programs, Florida Forever and Rome Family Lands, but they have a, a list of 2 million plus acres on that list. And Owl Hammock is not even currently on a list or for the Board of Trustees to review. Um, so should it be enrolled, which it's not, it would be competing against a slew of other properties and it would linger for years or just be lost. So Conservation Collier has a unique opportunity. Owl Hammock is right in our backyard and Collier County can play a huge role in the legacy of protecting the Florida Wildlife Corridor of which I believe over um, I think it's close to 80% of Collier County falls within the, floor, the designated Florida Wildlife Corridor uh, which has been designated by the state. So Collier County has a unique role to play in that legacy, and so I urge you to consider moving forward, especially with, well, the whole cycle, but especially considering the options and discussions for multi-year purchases with this Owl Hammock piece, because it will be a huge addition to Collier County. Um, so again, urge you to move forward with 10 and 11A, and then move forward with the process uh, 11B, um, because you can really uh, lend to that legacy of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. So thank you again for your time. Mr. Chair, that takes us to our final speaker who is on Zoom, Oscar Anderson. Ms. And Mr. Anderson, you're being asked to unmute yourself. If you'll do so, I see you've done that. You have three minutes, sir. Uh, hello, how are you? Oscar Anderson, uh, getting to you today from Orlando on behalf of the Bellini Family Capital LLC. Uh, I was and am still part of the lobbying effort in Tallahassee, which created the Florida Wildlife Corridor and works every year to get funding um, statewide for this. I also happen to serve on the board of the Florida Wildlife Corridor Foundation. Um, first and foremost, I wanna thank you for taking up this agenda item today. Um, specifically, I wanna talk about the Owl Hammock purchase uh, for the, the efforts of the Florida Wildlife Corridor. The Owl Hammock purchase will 
create about or include enable us to include about five and a quarter miles of the gap between Big Cypress and OK SLU as a part of the large statewide effort and is, and is a crucial piece. Um, it, even with about half of the wildlife corridor already in conservation, it's still a major undertaking to, to preserve it. Efforts by local governments like Collier County are vital um, to the effort. Part of what we do is work with local governments, private trusts, and even the federal government along with the state because it's gonna take all of us together to make the preservation of the wildlife corridor a reality. Um, the importance of the Florida Wildlife Corridor has been recognized by the governor who had a bill signing ceremony inside the, inside the wildlife corridor, as well as the Speaker of the House, Paul Renner, and also the Senate President and, and your Senator, Kathleen Pasadomo. President Pasadomo has continued her support of the Florida Wildlife Corridor and the efforts to preserve it. She has a pri priority bill this session, in fact, to increase public access to the corridor. One of the interviews post her designation, she made a comment that in 100 years, when legislators leaders look back at what happened in this decade, the thing they're going to take note of that was an amazing effort was this, this decision by the legislature to, to put focus and, and attention on the Florida Wildlife Corridor. She said it'll be considered one of the greatest accomplish, accomplishments of this decade. Um, I believe Owl Hammock is crucial to the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and I urge the commission to support it. Thank you. And that is our final registered speaker, Mr. Chairman. Okay. I want to call anybody back for questions, Commissioner McDaniel. No, I, I, may, maybe maybe we should bring back staff just for a reiteration of what we're actually buying today. And pull up, can you and uh, maybe pull up the slides for just a review? Ten A or ten eleven A, and then especially eleven B. Um, one of the things I, I did want to do is really, um, and I wish Brittany was still here, but you know, thank my colleagues up here. The when we really a couple of meetings ago, whenever it was. When we were looking at list A and B, you know, a lot of times, sometimes people have a um, an aversion to some of the maybe the, the lots on Marco because they're expensive. But you know, real estate you get what you pay for, and real estate on Marco tends to be high priced. But as Brittany was saying, there's a huge concentration of environmental um, type things that need protection. So it's like you know, I don't want to get scared off by the prices. That's why I really um, was a big su supporter of negotiating the price so we don't lose something. But, you know, if we just look sort of at the cheapest prices, you'll never buy anything on Marco. And happy to say that, you know, collectively as a group, we, we have juggled the list and we do know where the priorities are and, you know, to protect um, the right type of, uh, of wildlife. But having said that, um, ma'am, over to you. So what are we looking at here? There's 11B, right? Yes. Uh, for okay. the record, I'm Summer Arake, Conservation Collier Program Supervisor, and uh, I can answer some of the questions that are, are lingering. Um, in addition to talking to you about uh, cycle 11B, and thank you to Ed for giving you all a, an overview of where we're at on our uh, fiscal um, impacts. So in regards to, um, somebody just had a question about, your, your, your one question was about cycle 10. Did you want me to start with 11B or no, cycle? Uh, no, I think start here. We could always work our way backwards. Okay. Okay. Can, can I make a suggestion? Yes. Just, Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. Start with 10. Okay. 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 Go, go to what we're buying today because the, the, the staff report, the executive summary is calling for a continuation of 11B till basically when you're ready to bring forward 12. And, and I don't see the consensus with this board today to actually follow that recommendation. So let's start with 10, 11A and what we're, or 10 and what we're buying and then have a discussion about 11B and its validity or not. Okay. When you get to B, though, do you have, like I just saw it was cut off at all the priority A's. Do you have the second slide that shows, like, what sort of missed the cut? To yes. re re okay, you do. Okay. Yes. Okay. So let's take a step back. Okay. I was here um, last year in January of 2022, and I brought you cycle 10. So you all approved a list. It had $17 million worth of property on it. And so far to date, we have spent $3.5 million. Many, many properties, millions of dollars of properties just dropped off the list because either one, they didn't make it to appraisal, the pr they didn't want to wait long and that long, um, they wanted to sell to somebody else, or by the time we gave them the offer, they didn't accept the offer. So you approved $17 million, and we have spent $3.5 million to date. The $3.5 million is your list right in front of you. We have these. These yes, we have acquired these properties, 320 acres. And 
Are there any that are still though in, in flux? Like yeah, you said, so there's still is, a few hanging loose. That is right? a separate. Yeah. That's the next list. Gotcha. But these are the properties that that color that we have acquired. Those are now in ownership. These were on the original list. These are the properties that you have approved the purchase agreement, but we probably will will um, close on them in the next month or two. But we won't right? lose these, uh, you know, most we, likely, right? Most likely these, not. Okay. Okay. So let's let one detail that I think is missing is that these preserve expansion and multi-parcel project areas, which I will go into detail when I talk about cycle 11B. Those are areas where you have these small 1.14 and you see on here, Panther Walk is a preserve expansion existing red maple. Look at the acreages that you see on here, 1.14 acres, okay? So what happened with this cycle and will happen with many more cycles if we keep going like we have is, once we got to the point where we realized we are not going to consume the budget, and you all approved 17 million, but our budget was actually 14 million. When we realized we have preserve expansion areas, which the way that we presented it to you was that if there's budget left over, we will send letters. Multi-parcel projects, same. If there's budget left over, we send letters. So by the time September of 2022 came around, and of course we had things in motion before that, we were like, we have the budget, we can send letters. So in September of 2022, we sent letters to four areas, Gore, Panther Walk, which is Horse Pen Strand, um, Winchester Head, and Red Maple Swamp. And those, the majority of the, whoop, of the people that you see on, I don't know where that, maybe Ed can pull it up for me. No, nope. this list right here, these are from those letters that were sent in September. So when you're asking, well, are we so delayed we haven't even closed on the properties that you approved last January? Those are because of these multi-parcel project areas. So those are going to be continually going. So if we're at a point in a cycle where we get to a point and we've got plenty of budget left, that's when we send offer letters, and they're offer letters that we send. So... Um, that's what these are. Did you have a question? I, I do. And I, I, do you want me to light up when I have a question, or just? Well, Commissioner sure. Saunders is, has been lit up, so let me go, let me go to him first, and then you you next, sir. Well, okay. I, w what I was trying to to understand, I think you're you're getting there, so mm -hmm. I, uh, I may want to wait just a minute. But um, on cycle uh, ten a, 11A, that's the thirty five million. Staff's recommendation is to hold off on those until September. My view is we should vote today to move forward with those as the CLAC has suggested. It's 11B. I'm sorry, 11B. 11B. I'm yes, sorry, 11B. I agree. Okay. And so I think that'll, that will probably be the motion that's ultimately made, and so we'll move forward with that. The other cycles that you're talking about, we've already approved those. Correct. So we don't really need to take any action on those, or Correct. do we? Those, those are updates that okay. are, we so, were asked to provide you all. Okay. So the only vote today, then, is going to be what to do with 11B. Correct. Right. And the purchase of the properties that you have here today on in 10. on 10 I don't think so no those con those contracts will, the remaining contracts will come back to you for approval this is just we've, we've already done that oh. what? From our the, the individual contracts will come back for individual board approval so those the ones that we've talked about on Marco Island those are working their way through the process and will come back as agenda items you've given direction to go do it now our word to execute so, mr. chairman would it be appropriate to make a motion now to move forward with the CLAC recommendation to move forward on cycle 11B for acquisition. Is that the appropriate with, motion? With, 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 yes. with, 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 with one proviso, and, and that is something that we haven't talked about. It was mentioned, Meredith or, or Brad Wan mentioned it, and that's the... Go I was going to say, Mr. Utter, I think, has indicated that if we need to have a two-year... No, 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 that, that, that's... That'll, in personally, uh, specifically on the Al Hammock piece, that'll come back to us when the contract, after the appraisals and everything are done. One, one proviso is there, um, there are several state organizations that are out acquiring land and that we, we should, with the approval of 11B, entertain partnership relationships with all of the environmental organizations as they're going along. I would like that to be part of the actual motion to move forward on 11B. 
just me personally, I, I, I think we're all, we're all supportive of what we're doing here. I just I don't, I don't want to artificially speed. I mean, I have some questions about 11B, just more out of curiosity. And so we'll get there when, when we get there. But I think, you know, the motion's coming. But, you know, that's, that's where I, I like what you're saying about, you know, we were very dynamic talking about negotiations. And that seems to have borne some fruit because the money that we save, maybe we can buy an extra parcel. And I'm also wondering when you look at some of these things, like, you know, some of the really large parcel parcels, is there a smarter way to acquire it in some sort of partnership or, or something like that? Um, uh, Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. Yes, sir. Go ahead. We, ha we have a motion. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner McDa McDaniels. <laughs> Or whoever you are, yeah, Sam, to Sam change, Brown, uh, change that. So, I'm, I'm, could you restate that again? So, all I'm saying, I'll, and I'll amend the motion. M moving forward on cycle uh, on 11B on cycle 11B, uh, with the pursuit of available partnerships with other agencies. I'll amend the motion to, re to reflect, that. and I'll second that if you'll make that amendment. Okay. Um, and and the, um, and and I, I would just caught and but let's vote if you want to I mean, go go ahead and I mean, do the vote on that for now yeah. or. I mean, because, I mean, I'm just making a suggestion. I, I I just still have a few questions, and so so that we all you know vote either unanimously or split or whatever. I mean, Commissioner Hall or Commissioner Cole, I don't see you lit up. Do you have any no. any questions? Okay. Question okay. Well, I, I shut you off, but I'll keep you back. You're back on now. I just want to be clear. That yeah. Cycle ten, because I know Commissioner yeah. McDaniel mentioned what are we spending today and so we're not spending anything not today spending i just want to be clear right. on that and the biggest thing on the table is us getting this 11b moving forward right. just getting it into motion and i i feel much better that i that i'm not going to see one of these every meeting <laughs> that it, it sounds like we are going to have some sort of scheduled cycle we're going to stick to yes and because like i said i just felt overwhelmed like three months and looking at two already and if i may so. um so the reason that you you're seeing us so close together is we were I was actually sitting out there ready to present to you on not to you you weren't here on September 27th, okay? And then we all know what happened on that day. So cycle 11A was supposed to be heard on September 27th, and then it got delayed because of the hurricane. So now you will see us every six months with a list, but you will also probably see me sometime after I talk to the county manager to present to you the target areas for cycle 12 when we're ready to do that because the way that we get the majority of the people on these lists is by sending target letters okay i just feel i feel comfortable <laughs> that you know dealing with levin b today right. and you know and dealing with anything that comes before us once it goes to contract and we'll just handle it as they come so I I just have two two quick things, and I'm going to give it to Commissioner McDaniel. But before we vote, because I just want to see it out of curiosity to sort of complete the cycle here. Um, number one, I do think it's important that um, you know it's great to move forward. But however, the county manager decides to keep us updated. I don't want to vote on 17 million dollars worth of, of properties on on cycle 10, and then here a year later we only bought two million dollars worth of those properties. So you know, keeping us updated on great, we voted. Voting is is not the goal. The goal is what did we what did we acquire, and and added to that, I don't want to just get a list that says, well, we bought three million, we lost ten, uh, you know, uh, uh, fourteen million dollars worth of properties. I'd like to know why, because part of tightening up the process might be, you know, to to your your uh, words, you said, wow, a couple of sellers dropped out because they thought we were taking too long. Um, okay, I kind of want to know that because maybe we need to smarten up our our process or you know they sold to somebody else at a much higher value okay well we're not going to pay well above the appraised value but that report card coming back to us and it might not even be at this meeting it might be something that certain commissioners want a, a deeper dive and we can get it from the county manager so you know i would just say that and then i would like to see um the b priority list on 11b um if you have if you're able to pull it up so 11b we all see the a we're all familiar with it we've been studying it but i wanted to sort of see the slide below it and see the ones that didn't make the a priority list and then um it should be right on your screen there okay a, oh, okay and okay and then on pri on the on the proposed um a category when you had the priorities one two and three explain to me what those what those mean again so are we trying harder on the ones that are priority one or it just means they have more stuff on them um what, what do those just, numbers mean that's just the order that appraisals are obtained it gives staff a clack it's clack and the board giving staff direction what on to chase one, first which ones to obtain appraisals on first okay i got you uh, commissioner mcdaniel 
Yeah, I forgot what I was going to ask. Okay. No, no, no. I'm, no, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, um, I, I, want, I want you to say out loud, or I want to hear from you out loud, that just because you send a letter of an offer and you've got this theoretical surplus of budget, because that's one of the things that we keep arguing with ourselves, we, we approved a cycle 10 to 17 million in aggregate acquisitions and you spent five. Uh, and you, you, Commissioner Castro said two, but it, in my math, it's closer to five. Mm -hmm. Assuming we get through the balance of your shown agreed upon contracts for 10, uh, we're gonna be close to five. But just because you send a letter out offering somebody uh, because you, you move into this um, um, solicitation process as opposed to voluntary coming to us and telling us you have land you want us to buy as a seller, um, I would caution you, to, similar to what Commissioner LaCastro just got done saying, we, we need to know where you're at from either from you or from, from our senior staff because we're over here approving 17 million in cycle 10 and you've only burnt 10 or five. You've only, you've only spent five so far. We need to know potentially uh, on a more regular basis an update on the activities that are going on with the cycles that we've already approved. We don't approve a cycle until it's gone through your staff and CLAC and recommendations and then we approve the cycle and then that sends you out to go get appraisals and that sort of thing. So I think for a better my own better edification, if we, if we had more regular updates on the progress of these other properties that have fallen off the list. I mean, if, you know, if, 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 if there's $5 million worth of property that's not on cycle 10 anymore, it isn't on cycle 10 anymore. What have we done with that money? Where are we appropriating it? And how are we going forward to manage the difference? It doesn't mean you have this excess budget that theoretically you can spend or, or go out and do. It just means that there's there, there was money that we appropriated to make those acquisitions that didn't get spent in that cycle. And that's something that I'd like to be, I'd like to be better informed on throughout the process. Me too. Okay. <laughs> and that was carried over from FY22 to FY23. So that FY23 number that you see includes that, includes that money there because our our initial budget would have been around for FY23 would have been approximately 20 million dollars so you see how much was carried over I like how you put on B too that those are still going to be carried over we're not just going to throw them by the wayside that they might rank a lot maybe they didn't make the cut this time right I mean that's what I'm inferring here is that they're still important they might rank higher on cycle 12 or 13 or, or whatever correct correct so okay all right. Any other questions? Oh, we have no more public speakers, right? County manager? Sure. Just like we provide regular project updates on some of mm -hmm. the, the higher visibility capital projects, we'll develop a way that we can keep you um, informed uh, as we move through these acquisitions. Yeah. You'll be seeing the contracts coming forward because you are the final approval, but we can we can keep you um, informed as to how they're progressing. I just don't want to pat ourselves on the back that like, wow, we approved $13 million worth of things. And then 12 months later, we find out we only bought 3 million. And then, you know, we're hearing from either a property owner, which I've gotten emails before saying, gosh, you guys took too long. And you know what, I moved on to, to something else. And I'd rather hear that from the staff first, not from folks out in the fields kind of thing. But it sounds like we're all paddling in the same direction. Okay. Is there any other, I think we've got a, we got a motion on the floor. We have a second, unless there's any Commissioner comments, um, any public comment left? Okay, We've got a motion on the floor in a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously, 11B. Didn't delay anything at all, did we? No. Okay. <laughs> and, and I do have a question. Why are we not approving the properties that are, have been renegotiated and under contract? Why aren't we just buying those today? We, we're gonna bring the contracts to you back. Um, that's the way that they're traditionally brought back, um, not in a bundle, uh, and delegate, it's not delegated to, to my authority to, to sign them. So we've brought them back as individual agenda items. It doesn't mean we can't have multiples on the agenda, and that's the intent. They're just not on this agenda today. Well, and and uh, I just was curious because they're ready, they're done, they're negotiated contracts. Why, why, didn't, <clears throat> why, why 
why we, why didn't we do that today? Um, I'm not certain that they're ready paperwork wise. We can check with the staff on that. But but secondly, I think we wanted to make sure that we had full transparency and your direction on this agenda item before we loaded up a whole bunch of, of contracts. Um, same reason why we took a little extra time to look at each one to be sure that we were consistent with your direction. We will expedite them onto the agenda. It would be my vote that we have them in in bulk. I, I don't need we I don't need to see individual ones on yeah. each one. I think anything you can streamline, you know, because um, we're talking about there's a little there can be a little lag in this process. So anything you see, Miss Patterson, we're we're all for it. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take a court reporter break here, and we'll come back at three. Eleven minutes. Look at you. Oh, we don't have much left. No.
Chair, you have a live mic. Okay, ready to resume. Where are we going, County Manager? We are going to former 16F7, now item 11E. This is a recommendation to approve change order number three and change order number four under agreement number 19-7650, Golden Gate Golf Course Redevelopment Project, providing for a time extension of 730 days and a realigning of task funding with a $0 change and to approve payment of invoices for work associated with change orders number three and number four, which was verbally staff directed prior to approval of those change orders. This was moved to the regular agenda via the separate requests of Commissioner Saunders and Commissioner LeCastro. Mr. Ed Finn, your Deputy County Manager is here to answer questions. Thank you, ma'am. Um, yes, sir. Um, the uh, time extension uh, on this contract is, is largely driven by uh, the site conditions, unforeseen site conditions, regulatory conditions at the, at the site. Um, the, uh, this particular contract includes services all the way through construction, and that's why it's such, a, uh, such an extended period in excess of 700 days. Um, I, I will tell you that the trajectory this is on uh, looks like construction is early start date is probably in the January range on the golf course itself at this point in time. So um, I know that's a, a big big chunk of days to bite off on, but we wanted to bring it to the board uh, in a single single, uh, single chunk so that it, we're not distracted by those days uh, as we try to close this thing up and, and bring it to a good conclusion. What were your concerns, Commissioner Saunders? You know, I, I asked for this to be pulled off, but I really don't know why. <laughs> Okay. I mean, I ask for it to be pulled off. Sometimes I, you know, I ask for things to be pulled off. I get the right answer, the, an answer that I like from, um, usually it's from the county manager's team when they come in to, to brief me the day before. And and, and on this one, I, I did get the answer that I liked, but I just want to make sure my colleagues also like it. And also, and so that's why I, I pulled it because it, sometimes it's worthy of discussion, sometimes it's not. Also the general public, sometimes when they pull the agenda, it's, there's kind of like not enough explanation here. So it looks like we're sort of like, stupid you know wow 730 days why would you do that and so you know for discussion in public to explain you know should it maybe come to us twice and we we take a smaller bite out of the apple is there value to that i mean i, I don't mind hearing something i don't mind getting you know um you know issues coming to us on a more regular basis if that's what's smart similar to like what we've, we've done in some other instances so that was why i i pulled it it just seemed like a big amount of days wow you know two years is that what we want to vote on today? And then, you know, when you pull it, it gives the other commissioners a chance to maybe ponder it, think about it, or, you know, they've got a different, you know, perspective. So I don't know, Commissioner Saunders, if that's the thing that jumped out at you is the 730? No, no, because I, 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 I knew that was going to be that much because mm -hmm. we've had delays, uh, a lot of which were caused by our initial engineering contracts that we had going back a couple of years ago. Um, and so uh, I, I think really I just wanted to let the board know that, uh, everything seems to be on board now. Um, the For the Big Shots facility, they've got all of their permits in place. My understanding is they've had to increase their loan because everything's gone up, so th that loan has been approved now. And so there's some paperwork going forward for the Big Shots. Um, and er everything is moving along. Uh, though it's a couple years delayed, I uh, just want the board to know that, that things are looking very positive. Construction <clears throat> should begin. Uh, first of May on the big shots and then as you said maybe January of next year but I think perhaps a little sooner than that on the golf course uh, well, um, as you might imagine we'd, we would like like nothing better yep. than to move that forward but the good news is everything is moving the bad news is it's, it's been a long time I, I, I fear much much of the time is is sunk at this point it, the the time was incurred long ago and and we're just trying to make this thing move now that we have a little bit of little bit of forward momentum Commissioner McDaniel yes I, I uh, I got a satisfactory out of answer out of staff yesterday on this item as well, but uh, now that you brought it up for uh, a, a discussion, I, I did have a concern with regard to the uh, verbal uh, approval of change orders outside of the guise of the contract. Can you give a little explanation uh, on that? I, I certainly will. Uh, the, uh, the timing of that was in between as we were changing project managers. Uh, the timing of it seemed very critical to get that that moving forward. Uh, Commissioner Saunders just alluded to a time in this contract where there was a lot of stagnation in what was going on and a lack of direction. Um, uh, the county manager uh, and myself kind of became engaged in it. 
Uh, we gave what we, we thought was clear direction, and it, and it was, and it allowed this thing to move forward a little quicker. Um, unfortunately, the, the staff member that was running this project actually uh, left, left the county, and, and this particular piece of uh, important contract administration was not completed in a timely basis. No worries. We'll move for approval. Commissioner Saunders, why don't you uh, make the motion? I'll make a motion to approve uh, Sorry. Yeah. the uh, change. Second. Okay. Yeah, I got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passage unanimously. Thank okay. You. Moving to 15A. 15A. 15A is public comments on general topics not on the current or future agenda by individuals not already heard during previous public comments in this meeting. And we have no such speakers registered. Okay. okay. We're going to go to item 15B, which is staff project updates. Would you like to start with the rock crushing? Oh, absolutely. I thought so. <laughs> Who's in charge of that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never thought I'd care about as many rocks as much as I do. You know, somebody corrected me and said, we've been saying rock, it's actually concrete. <laughs> somebody sent me an email on that. <laughs> We're like, yeah, we, we, we know what it is, thanks. <laughs> um, Jamie Cook, your Director of Development Review at Growth Management Community Development. Um, so at the last meeting that I had updated you, which was the second meeting in January, um, we had estimated that they were about 30% complete with the crushing activities. The two weeks immediately following that were actually very good. Um, they crushed about 6,100 the first of those two weeks and about 7,000 the second. Um, however, the last two weeks have been a bit of a setback due to equipment failures. Both of the crushers had mechanical failures and have been down for about a week and a half. Um, as of this morning, I, I did go by this site this morning, and my inspections team has also been out there. The track hoe is operating, so it is separating and moving material around. Um, there is one of the crushers is operating again, so they are doing some crushing activities. Um, and from what we understand, they have ordered another crusher that is being shipped here uh, from Sweden. So given the fact that we're now based on staff estimates, maybe about 45% of the way there, we're slightly hesitant that they will be able to finish by that original May 1st deadline that was discussed. Um, as, uh, Troy, if you can pull up the other. As we were talking letter. about the break, it's not really an additional crusher. They got a broken one, and so they're not, they're not sort of gaining momentum with additional crushers. They're sort of fixing the one or replacing the one that's broke, broken, right? Correct. Yeah. And I did want to remind you of the stipulations that we had set forth with them when we originally renewed their site development plan for the rock crushing activities only. Um, the hours of operation were limited at that time, but at your December board meeting, you voted to extend them to allow them to crush in accordance with our, our land development code, hours of construction, which is 6.30 to 7, um, Monday through Saturday. We have put additional restrictions on them, such as watering on the crusher must be maintained at all times, which they are doing. They are continuing to send me the weekly report. Um, staff is continually going out there to verify the conditions, see if they're working, and making sure that they're maintaining the rest of these, um, these requirements that we've set in place. However, as I said, you know, we are a little skeptical at this point that they may be finished by May 1st. Commissioner McDaniel. Well, in keeping with the theme, uh, I, I, I've been in the belly of the beast before. I've owned two different crushers myself. If you ever ask for or feel like you want somebody who's been there, done that, uh, to come and look to make sure that you're being told the truth as to what's in fact going on, uh, I'd be happy to go. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of things that... There's a lot of moving parts on a crusher. There's a lot of moving parts on a track hoe. And unless you've actually been in them, literally, um, you, you really have a, you, you showing up and seeing that it's broke and the operator saying that it's broke, you have to accept that. I can go look at it and, and maybe offer you a, a little different perspective. So if you would like, I'll, I'll volunteer. Officer, please escort Commissioner McDaniel out of the building immediately over to the rock crushing lot. Yeah, I'll go. Not now. 
Yeah. Not You're now. Sweden rock crushes yeah. are. Yeah. <laughs> I just got to say I'm I'm like not 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 pleased, you know, with the inconsistent you know, rock that they've been crushing. I realize these machinery breaks and things happen, but you know, I said last year, is it is it a possible? Is it appropriate? Is you know, is it an option to you know bring bring in some dumb, tru dumb trucks and pick up some uncrushed rock and at least try to you know burn the candle from both ends? And at the time, maybe that sounded crazy. I can tell you, we get we start getting closer to one May in that lot. I have been out to that lot. I maybe don't have the the depth of um, Sweden crushers, um, but uh, you can. One of the things I told you, Jamie, that I think is just ridiculous is, yeah, the lot the crush the rock that they've crushed. They have it in a like five story pile sitting right by the edge of the road, which five you know, story. it's pretty high. It's not five story. Okay, what is it? Words matter. What is it, Cliff? It, it's, 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 it's tall. It's probably 20 feet high. No, it's high. Oh God, no, it's way higher than that. Okay, but, it, but it's a high pile. So, I mean, you're spreading the rock or you're not. Um, I, I think even a lay person could go out there and it doesn't look like a, a polished, you know, um, operation. And, um, you know, so, I mean, we're, we're sitting here at the end of February, and you know, if you work the algorithm, they're not going to make it till May. I just think that we we don't sit here and wait to May and just sort of watch the the spreadsheet change, good or bad. We we start to 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 anticipate what we think might happen and and come up with some some viable possible options uh, and get some direction from them. And, and also too um, to both Jamies, we had said before if we wanted to have the the property owner here, you know, I think maybe at the next meeting, the next update, you know, we, we make it mandatory that they're here. You've been giving us great updates and, and reporting back as, um, as directed, but I'm just, uh, I'm just concerned. It's starting to slow a bit and things, everything that's happened happens, but I don't know if this is a priority for this, you know, landowner or not. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've driven by there a lot and just visually, I didn't go out on the property and, you know, work the algorithm, but you know, there's been more than a couple of times I've had to call and say, weeds are tall. The rock is piling up. It does. I didn't see any activity out there. And it just seems like, you know, we're, we're, we're expending a lot of our own personnel to sort of confirm what he's doing or not doing, but if you if you do the math, they're they're not going to be close on one May. Well, and and based on the stip the way we wrote these stipulations after May first, they're not going to be able to crush anyway without coming back for additional right. approval. Um, well, Commissioner McDaniel, go ahead. Just 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 as a thought, I mean, if if you would like, I'd be happy to meet with them, talk to their operator, talk to the owner. At the, at the end of the day, this boils down to a dollars and cents. This is a this is uh, how much money does the owner have to spend in order to rectify a previous contractor's error. It's that simple. So um, if, if you, I mean, they, there are people that, I have friends that own crushers, and you can call them, and per ton they'll come, they'll, they'll bring the crusher to your property and crush the concrete. So um, it, they're over there in the huddle right now. Well, let, let me just ask you all, do you feel like, you know, I mean, I mean, I appreciate, you know, Commissioner McDaniel's expertise and offering it, but also, too, we have a whole bunch of people on the county staff that should have some of this expertise, maybe not to the level that he does. And if you think adding him to the evaluation team would help, then we probably should have done it a month ago. But what are, what are, what are your thoughts? What can you tell us? Um, so, yes, I would be happy to try to arrange that time for, for Commissioner McDaniel's staff and, and their contractor to meet. Um, but again, this, this May 1st date was not the date that staff had originally wanted. This was the date that they said, based on these hours of operation, they yeah. could meet. And then at the December board meeting, when they were here and you extended their hours, they, they indicated to you that that would help them finish much sooner than May 1st. Well, and we never agreed so. to it, a final date. I mean, I remember Correct. sitting here saying, no, we're going to take smaller bites out of the apple. We want an update every seven days. We'll watch how the how the numbers change. And then, you know, 1 April might be the day that we keep hold you to. Or we might sit here and say, well, you know, it's not going to be 1 May, but they're 98% done, so it's 15 May. But we couldn't, we, we couldn't tell that last fall, last winter. But we're starting to get closer to it now. So, um you know, I just, I just sent a note yeah. to Christina to set that up with you. Okay. So That's good. Thank you. As soon as possible, I'd be happy. And I think regardless of what happens with that meeting at the next uh, BCC meeting, we need the, the property, you know, leadership here so we can uh, we can have a, a, a deeper dive, you know, discussion. Okay. 
And I can tell you, the Rock Crusher from Sweden won't be here tomorrow. So, um, you know, track that arrival. And like, like Jamie French said, it's not an additional. So it's not like they have three crushers going. They got one that's dead, one that sounds like it's partially dead. And they're just sort of moving the peas around on the dish, you know, making it look like they're eating the, the dinner, but they're not. Um, so I'm really concerned. And, you know, to Commissioner McDaniel's point, it, it, you know, it is about dollars and cents and everything. But let's not... Um, Let's, and, and, and you're not inferring this, but I want to make sure the citizens aren't lost in this. You know, at the end, you know, we had a gentleman sitting here who bought a piece of property that then found out there was a whole bunch of liens. And we're like, hey, you got to really do your homework. You know, if this guy took it over from somebody that didn't do their homework, well, then you know what? He's responsible. And if he doesn't have the dollars and cents to get 10 crushers out there or to be smart enough to use the extended hours, I mean, I'm not sitting here feeling bad for him. And so um, if we have to give direction to say, you know what, uh, over the next seven days, there's going to be hundreds of trucks trucking out uncrushed rock and bringing it to a to a to a dump or a location um, that very well might be possible to get this thing done. But I don't think he gets an unlimited amount of time just because boo hoo, you know, he took over something from somebody that sort of screw, screwed it up. I mean, we've got expectations here and this is smack dab in the middle of my district and I hear from these citizens and they've been damn patient. So I think, you know, patients are running out. That lot looks horrible, whether it's a 10 foot pile of, of rubble or whatever it is, it looks unsightly. Aesthetically, that lot looks horrible. And, you know, I'm very disappointed that the numbers aren't exponentially growing when we've, you know, approved the extra people, the extra machinery, the extra hours. And, you know, granted, he had a he had a bad week and had a couple of a good possible spikes. But I was hoping and, and I know you were as well, that we were going to see, you know, some, uh, you know, some, uh, a, a stretch here of, of a good run. But we're not. So and, you know. and, and on that point. Our landfill receives construction. Deposits. Absolutely. We have a fee structure out there that's very, candidly, it's very prohibitive. It's one of the reasons why this site ended up with so much materials because we were charging $1,000 a load and Bobby was charging 200 and went to 400 uh, So all the in-haul stopped coming to our landfill and going to, going to this site. And so maybe maybe depending on cost associated with the extra crusher and so on and so forth maybe we just stop the crushing and tell them to and, and cut them a deal with uh, with our landfill and reduce our fees over there for the receiving of that because that's material that we ultimately then recycle and use for restructures and habitat out in the gulf of mexico so that but i'd, I'd like to go have a look yeah. and you also have a relationship with those folks so i think it's i do you know, whatever you all can so at the, the next meeting, let's have, a, let's have a great update. Not only will we get one from Commissioner McDaniel, but you all, but then also let's have the property owner here too so we can have a, a deeper dive conversation. We've got two weeks, and, um, and I'll make that happen. We're not voting on anything, obviously. So anybody have any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am. Yep. Uh, before we go to our parks updates, I'm just going to give you a quick update on uh, our conversation last meeting about the impact fee deferral question for the Golden Gate, uh, for the affordable housing at the Golden Gate Golf Course. Okay. Um, so we've been looking into some options, have reached out to Mr. Kirk, and we'll be talking with him. Part of this is understanding the time frames that he needs um, in order to make this, this financing piece work, which is common for this type of project, um, making sure that we're aligning those time frames, having a 10-year deferral on a 35 or 50-year affordability period uh, creates some difficulties. Um, so that is in work now. We have found out some information about how, there, uh, how other counties are managing uh, um, and something new in the last couple of years to the statute that allows us to handle these impact fee deferrals and waivers a little bit differently. So we're, we're going to be provided some information from Nassau County um, and look at how to structure that. Now, super important is the income levels that are going to be provided at this have to only reach a certain point in order to qualify for this, this statu essentially this, this statutory provision. So um, once we have that information in hand, I'm going to work with the county attorney and we'll return back to you with some options. Um, rest assured that this type of option does require a long-term land use restriction on the property so that for the public benefit, we can guarantee the affordability of these units. But moving in a positive direction looking forward to bringing that back to you didn't we, didn't we have the, that the golden gate property is being held in perpetuity and affordable status yes. 
Uh, yes, but they cannot, the part of the statutory provision, they cannot exceed 120% at their entry into, um, into this program. Now, if they earn more money over time as, as they're living there is okay, but that has to set that cap at the income at 120% of AMI. That's to get in the front door. Once they're in there and they elevate but, their income. Then they can go to 140. So we're going to work with Mr. Kirk on that as he's working to adjust those um, AMI, the, the, their, his percent of AMI um, for those various units. And that, that's in work now. What was his ask? Was he asking for a 10-year or, or for a mirror of the deferral? Do you recall? He was looking for a, a longer-term deferral or payment um, similar to a couple of other developers that we've been working with, this 10-year this um, limit that we have as part of our ordinance has um, has presented some difficulties as it as it fits into their into their financial uh, incentive layering. Right, I, I th and I think when I met with the folks at the Immokalee Fair Housing Alliance, we we uh, amortized that over a 30-year period, and they bit they they they, they could because because it, it was a known expense that they could build into their budget. And, and carry the exp carry the cost. So that 30-year AM may, might be something for us to look at. I mean, because if if we attach it to the property as on an amortized basis and and, a, and a, as a non-ad valorem assessment, then we have uh, a guaranteed capacity to receive that money back, irrespective of the operator. Commissioner Saunders is let up here. Let me let me give him the floor. First, I want to th thank you for uh, having some priority to this because the the. Uh, Folks that are contributing money to this project, the uh, philanthropists, if you will, uh, are obviously very nervous about this because it's been so long, and they're they're looking at other options for their for their money. And so, time is of the essence. Um, the uh, ten-year waiver doesn't do any good uh, for the financing. The problem is that uh, because of the increase in cost, there is a gap between what this project will generate in terms of revenue. Uh, and the amount of money that's needed to build the project. And so we're trying to close that gap. That gap's about five or six million dollars. Impact fees happen to be about that amount. And so if we're able to um, alleviate the problem of impact fees on this project to a point where it satisfies the, the bank, <coughs> then this project moves forward. If we don't do that, then we have, we have a problem. So um, a, a amortization or some sort of a payment schedule on impact fees won't do the job. There's going to have to be a, uh, an elimination of some of the cost uh, for this project to move forward, and that, that, that the impact fees just happen to be right about the same, the right amount. So, um, if there's a way to use that statute to eliminate the payment of impact fees, that that really is is probably the only alternative that we have. So, I would encourage you to do that. And time is of the essence. So we, Absolutely. Um, we need completely to completely understand to move and, that. Um, and we have provided that there there was a little bit of a misunderstanding I think that was directed back to our our partners about our um, about our our dedication to this cause um, that we have not stepped away from this project we fully uh, intend to run down solutions to these current challenges um, until we have a solution. So, and I did communicate that back to the Community Foundation to rest assured we weren't walking away from either the impact fee issue or the remediation issue. Both are in work now and we're continu continuing to work those issues. And they will hopefully set um, us up for the next successful affordable housing project to follow this one. Um, so it's, this is a, this this, is a good this thing. This would be a, a really nice template for mm -hmm. other, other projects, uh, but we gotta get this one across the finish. Absolutely. Commissioner Kowal and then Commissioner Hall, you're on deck. Thank you, Chairman. Now, would this be, you can correct me if I'm wrong, would this be an opportunity to, because I know statutorily we have to collect impact fees, you know, because statute we, it tells us we have to, but um, would this be an option to where with the affordable housing uh, fund that we do have with the $20 million, could those monies be used to offset the difference? So those those monies from the the sales tax are uh, earmarked for um, <laughs> land purchases, and there are other funding sources that can potentially be used for backfills. Um, we're looking at a, a sta essentially what's a statutory exemption and how that's being handled by other counties. Um, there's always been this question of the backfill uh, required. This this statute takes that backfill away to some extent, but as the county attorney and I have discussed, it doesn't eliminate the need for the infrastructure. So we're looking, um, between us, are discussing um, how we're going to address 
the needed capital improvements driven by these types of projects while still finding that relief for the project. And so that's um, that's kind of that's the challenge that that we have being able to um, to articulate that to you and also have a plan as to how we address those infrastructure needs absent impact fees in, in theory. Thank you. Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Chair. So I'm just thinking about, you know, you, it was mentioned that we can defer impact fees for 10 years and we can fairly get away with that with the intention. So what if after 10 years, um, Mr. Kirk executes a note that's inferior to his, to his regular financing to the county that has terms on it, kicking it down however long he else, and, and it just balloons. No, you know, no payments, just a small interest bearing note that balloons 10 more years after that or 20 years after that. Just a possibility, just, I just wanted to throw it out there as another method of kicking it down the road further. Sure, absolutely, and that's why we really, um, we wanna talk with Mr. Kirk, which we intend to do this week. Our schedules didn't mesh up last week at the end of the week, um, so that we can understand exactly what type of time frames and other things there are. So as Commissioner Saunders said, we know that we've got a, a, fun, a bit of a funding gap, well, a funding gap in this project as it stands now. E-impact fees are only one of those tools that we could use to to try to try to realign, but um, he, he may, he's very, very, um, he's very experienced in affordable housing. He understands these layering of incentives. So when we understand his needs, we'll be able to properly position ourselves. But we wanted to communicate to the board and also to the public that our commitment still stands to work through this financial issue and come back to you with, with the options that work both for us and for Mr. Kirk. Good. Okay. Any other discussion? Commissioner Saunders, you want to wrap this one up? Nope. Okay. Okay. Um, if you're, if if it's uh, the pleasure of the board, we'll get an update on CAC Sambas Pass from is it Olima, Olima Edwards, Parks Interim Parks Director. Good afternoon, Commissioners. All right. So, what you have before you today on the uh, the the prompter is the update for the CAC Sambas um, Boat Park Marina. We are planning on doing a soft opening for March uh, 15th that is for limited recreational use only, no commercial. Um, as you can see right now, we're phasing this project into two phases. Well, let me back up. Let me show you the initial damage assessment first. So initially when we went out after Hurricane Ian, um, CAC Sambas sustained a lot of damage. Um, you can see the damage to the ship store, the parking lot, um, the boardwalk was destroyed. Um, we have parts of the boardwalk missing, docks was missing, we have seawall erosion, and uh, the gasoline fuel pumps were, uh, dispensers were damaged. For our phase one opening plan, like I said, we're, we're opening CAC Sambas on March 15th, um, and that's gonna be for limited recreational use. We need to be able to move the fence, and that happened today. We fenced off the entire um, site. Some are permanent, some are for temporary fencing. The temporary fencing will be by where the, the ship store was. Um, we're gonna use this for limited recreational activity, so no commercial, and that will be for kayaks, um, paddle craft, but currently right now, it will not be for motorized vessels because we have to move the smaller dock and that will be in phase two, um, getting that relocated back to the seawall once we get that repaired. Right here, and the temporary fencing went along today. We just completed that today. Contractors were out. As you can see, um, we're putting chain link fence temporary, temporary along the, I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous. We're putting fencing along the, the seawall area to, to uh, keep it safe for the constituents that come out to use the ramp. We're also um, putting, putting fencing around the, um, the marina ship store, and we're adding gates to where we can come in and out as we need to. Again, like I told you, we also need to to relocate the eight by 30 inch dock from the east side ramp towards the west side of the ramp for limited boating. That will be in phase two of our opening plan. Um, the way that we're going to 
manage, you know what? <laughs> the way that we're going to manage this plan is that we're going to have two park rangers. They're going to be there. We modified the hours from 8 to 5. Um, we're going to have two park rangers, one to check to make sure that people are not trying to come in for commercial activity. The other one is also to make sure that the ramp is safe and people are coming and going as they need to go. This will be seven days a week that we'll have it staffed. Um, once people come in to go out, we, as you can see, we have the, the, um, the float plan, excuse me. We have the float plan that people will put on their cars. The rangers will check. We met with uh, the city of Marco police officers this week to let them know about our plan, to let them know how we're going to execute. If anybody gets locked in, they can contact the, um, the, the police department there. And then um, capital contractors is working to confirm um, that the fencing will be will be there. We work with Dan Smith with the city of, of Marco to get that approved to where we do not have to have permits to put up the temporary fencing. So they're in, involved and we did get uh, approval from them. So they've seen this plan. We presented to them last Tuesday to the Marco City. This plan we presented to them last Tuesday to the Marco City Council and they are fine with this plan for right now. Okay, so your phase two permanent repairs, and this is what we have to do to go through FEMA to get Caxambas up and running, hopefully, for commercial activity as we move forward. Um, the, um, currently, right now, we've, we've demoed the ship store. The debris has been picked up. Um, we've had power restored, but like I said, it's still unsafe because of the, the seawall, so we can't let people go in just yet. Um, the insurance adjuster visited the site. The structural assessment by WSP Environmental was completed on October 31st of 2022. We had change orders number one that authorized Aftermen to do the inspection and report on the impacts due to Hurricane Ian. Um, the seawall assessment was also completed by Aptum Engineering. In January of this year, uh, we received the Aptum Field Observation Report that showed the impact of the seawalls prior and after Hurricane Ian. Um, we talked about the Cat Simmons Park um, options of like opening up the boat ramp and we've had a team meeting to discuss how we'll move forward. The ongoing task is to make sure that we get the seawall repaired. This is probably gonna take about nine to 12 months. It was initially scheduled for repair before the hurricane happened. Um, after the hurricane, it kind of pushed us back a little bit, but we are working with our facilities management team to make sure that those repairs uh, happen. And again, like I said, it'll take about nine to 12 months. Um, And then for our fuel dispenser, we had a PO issued to Guardian to order materials to install new uh, fuel dispensers. So we're working on getting the fuel back at the marina at CAC Sambas. I know I went through a lot. I was a little nervous, so maybe we'll do better with the question and answering period. So I apologize. Here's where it gets worse, Ms. Edwards, <laughs> you know, the questions now. Um, just, just for my colleagues, this is obviously in District 1. And, um, um, I was out there last week again with the whole team um, assessing. Um, Keck Samus is, took, took worse of a hit than you can imagine. Even the pictures here don't do it, do it justice. Um, so it's been closed you know, since the hurricane. Um, appreciate the overview. Obviously, we, we were out there on site. But just a couple things that we talked about on site, but for my colleagues, anybody who's listening, um, let's make sure we really launch the announcement and it's not it's not confusing or ambiguous because um, m many people have said multiple times, it's closed to commercial, it's closed to commercial. It's also closed to motorized vehicle or vessels. So if you're a citizen and you have a little motorboat, um, you're not commercial, but you can't bring it out there. And if we don't get that word out clearly, the street is gonna be lined because it's season right now with Marco residents saying, yay, no commercial. I can't wait to go out there and launch my boat. And the reality is because of the damage in the dock. So we've got to be very clear. And then if you remember, we talked on site about having the right kind of signage well in advance on Marco because a complaint that I get from, you know, the 3,000 people that are all in those condominiums and, and are, are watching, you know, uh, what goes on there. One of the complaints they have that does have merit is, confused, uninformed citizens or business owners 
come barreling down that road on their way to Keck Sambas 50 miles an hour only to be turned away. And then they're frustrated and they barrel back down that road, you know, at 50 miles an hour. So we want to stop people. So, you know, either um, a sign at the Jolly Bridge and there's an electronic sign there now that, that says something else, but maybe we could put something on there. And then well before Keck Sambas. But we've got to make sure we really do couple no commercial and no motorized for anybody um because I'm, I'm i'm getting feedback from some people and i posted it on my social media and when i launched my newsletter today there's a whole chunk on keck sambas that has all this but we we got to burn the candle at every end um the other thing too is um we talked about it's great to see the two park rangers out there but i can tell you there's going to be aggressive people going out there and park rangers aren't armed guards and I don't want to see those folks put in harm's way or or sitting there trying to have an argumentative debate with somebody that thinks, you know, the park looks fine. I've got I sold 10 tickets to my jet ski people here because I didn't get the proper word. And while they're doing that, you know, five cars are going around them. So, you know, if you need me to make a call to the, um, you know, the Marco police chief or if we want to call, you know, uh, Colonel Bloom and have the sheriff out there. Um, but I, I really think we have to have somebody out there. Be, the, the park rangers are going to direct traffic and and um, confirm what the park will allow and what it won't but as we both know we've had people out there that have really treated those park rangers horribly and on the 15th that day is going to be the wild west show regardless of how we so let me know if you need my help like you said you all did a great job speaking before the marco city council and i'm sure you know we don't want to just have them on speed dial because when something's exploding at the gate it's too late to call 911 um, so i want to say that and then the other thing too, and correct me if I'm wrong, when, when we move forward with the plan to totally replace the seawall, the entire park gets closed again. So what we're doing here is opening it up for a window of time until such time that we get all of our ducks in the row for complete seawall replacement. And then we're going to shut it down again. And as Mr. Rodriguez and I were talking, let's make sure we really make smart decisions to try to, just like we did on the Goodland Road, to maximize or, or minimize the close, the full closure of the park in any type of season you know when we were just talking at the top off the top of our head it said yeah we'll probably you know close the the park around october and it'll be closed until the following you know april or may and then that's when my head exploded because i thought okay that's the dumbest thing in the world um i'd rather keep it partially open um but pull the trigger on on the seawall and it's going to bleed into some season but we want the bulk of it just like we did on the goodland road you know the county got so many accolades for that saying wow that was a huge project and the 80 percent of it was done when there was hardly anybody in goodland it's the same thing you know in that in that park but um you know we all saw it up front so so when i was there uh, last week when we were all there that plastic yellow fence has now been replaced and it's a cyclone chain chain link fence right to sort of to keep people away from the most dangerous places and to sort of funnel them into just where where they safely can launch correct yes, sir they completed that today once we leave here i can send you pictures um okay. i did follow up with staff and like i said i was a little bit nervous but now i can tell you all we have reached out to the marco uh city island police um to let them know about the the detail we will have more park rangers especially for the first week just to see how everything uh goes we've also uh contracted to have um armed security so while the park rangers are doing uh traffic detail if we have any issues we already have armed security there if if the city of marco cannot provide you know its details so i'm looking at both both um options just in case just in case. And then at the end of the day on the 15th, let's really assess. I mean, we're trying to be as proactive as possible and allow citizens to utilize the park. We know it's safe for kayakers and for people that are going to sit there at the picnic tables and whatnot. But if that park gets overrun, um, and even by the proper folks, but we think it, it sort of can't absorb the parking, the, com the commercial, or we see any type of unsafe issues, I, I know we won't hesitate to, to jump on that. Um, I know Commissioner Bill McDaniel's lit up here before I turn it over to him. I want to just shift gears because you're sitting here. We talked about Tiger Tail. Um, what was wrong with that bending machine? Why did it break in the first two days? Did we figure that out? Believe it or not, you were actually right. I knew it. <laughs> Somebody it's... put some some type of coin in, but they went out this morning, got it fixed, so you should be good to go. That's okay. that's what it was. I knew it because I, I said, know. these are brand new yeah. machines. So we don't have a snack bar out there, but Alima's just been great, and the whole staff has to try to deliver as much service out there as possible 
possible. So we put a bunch of vending machines in place to at least allow people to get beverages and some sort of snacks and food. And of course, immediately somebody put a homemade out of order sign on there. And then we were getting all this hate mail saying, you know, you, the county is stupid. They bought crappy machines. They broke after day one. And then you saw my email, which was, I bet you it's jammed with Canadian coins. And that's a homemade sign. We would, the, the sign that was on there is, we would, that would never be our sign. Um, how about the, 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 um, the, uh, um, the, the arm going in and out of the parking lot. So that's, that broke during the hurricane as well. Did we pull the trigger on what I was suggesting that we have some sort of like Bob's barricade there at the end of the day saying yes, park is closed. Yes, sir. And like I said, it won't keep old people from coming into the park, but if they come into the park and slip on a wet noodle and break their, their arm, you know, they're, they're trespassing. Yes, sir. But as it was now, it was sort of always defaulted in the up position. It was confusing a lot of people. Yes, so we sir. And that. we have a, a park closed sign that goes in front of the barricade. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner McDaniel. Well, and, and Commissioner LaCastro, you know, you're all over this stuff with back on Caxambas. That's where I'm going. Uh, fix the vernacular. When I was when I was hearing what you were saying, we all know what you're talking about, about commercial activity. And you, you have to be very, very specific. No motorized vehicles, period, to end. Yes, and sir. That was what was shared with me. But you say commercial, and that opens it up to all, all my crazies that are out there that want to go fishing. Yes, sir. And then number two, prioritize getting the ramp open so that the uh, motorized vehicles can go. Yes, sir. The, the ship store's nice, the fuel station's nice, but us fishermen, we're, we're like self-contained. We, we, we've been using Kelly Bayshore, Tom, Thompson Drive when it was Kelly Road ramp and stopping getting our bait at Dell's before we went down in there. So. Uh, niceties are way off on the list get the ramp open so that the people can utilize the ramp to get their boats in and out that's primary priority i mean even if you have to keep the seawalls blocked off for, from a safety perspective because as you've already shared the seawalls seawalls were on the list to be fixed anyway yes, sir. Uh, but get, get the get the access point so that the people can dump their boats and go what are we doing for restrooms on the 15th? Porta potties. Porta potties. Okay. Yes, sir. Just, just the normal straight up like construction type or like anything fancier? Uh, we're doing um, construction type right now. We have uh, three. One is ADA, two regulars, and hand washing stations. Okay. Yeah, and, th and those are fine. It's just the quantity because there'll be people out there that, you know, I mean, we don't want everybody waiting in line over one dirt. And then, you know, it goes without saying, and I know I'm just repeating things, but let's make sure that we have – the, the cleanup crew, you know, those those porta potties three days after we open aren't, you know, out of toilet paper, trash, nasty. Because that parks, that's, it's, there's going to be a lot of people out there on the 15th, Con some confused people. And so that word will travel fast if, if somebody didn't get the word. But it, it's going to be a busy place on the 15th and even a couple of days after. So, yes, sir. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? It's a, you know, the one thing I, I have told citizens is, you know, the glass is more than half full, parks and rec. I mean, think about just days after the hurricane, all the beaches, all the the parks, all the places that were repaired, restored, reopened. Caxambas is an anomaly. Um, yes, we were going to replace the seawall, but now the seawall is even in worse shape um, and everything else that we saw out there. So it's not a matter of, you know, we took a lot of heat. We all got a thousand emails from people open the damn park and, you know, add more parking and, and all that. And, um, you know, I worked really hard to educate the masses that it's the city of Naples that zones that park. It's the city of Naples that actually cut back on the park. City of Marco, I'm sorry. City of Marco that cut back on the parking for a reason. We now have a new Coast Guard station out there that eats up you know a bit of square footage so it's not it's not an optimum setup but it's a small very popular park that we cannot make any larger and so we've got a lot of big decisions to make down the road when it comes to re-permitting boats and things like that because that park just cannot absorb the popularity of it but thanks so much for all the hard work that you're doing out there Jim Morton who was you know he's leading the charge here so we blame him if it something gets messed up but um thank you thank you okay what's our next update Ms. Patterson, anything? Uh, Tanya Williams is going to give you an update on our commercial permits for the, the boat launches. Okay. This is the, the last staff update that we have. You can have a seat. Good afternoon, commissioners. For the record, Tanya Williams, your interim public services department head. Uh, for the benefit of uh, Commissioner Hall and Commissioner Kowal, I just wanted to kind of brief you on our commercial boat launch permit process. Um, Parks and Rec staff is in, is in midstream 
of working with uh, our commercial launch vendors that currently hold permits from 2022 that have been renewed for 2023. Uh, but I wanted to bring everyone up to date on where we started and where we're at today. So just to quickly recap, November 9th, 2021, agenda item was brought before the board that was adopted as a boat ramp park management strategy to better provide balance of recreational commercial use of your public boat ramp facilities. Then in February 22 of 2022, the board set a limit on the commercial boat launch permits to cap at 200 permits issued. Currently, your Collier County Parks and Recreation Division um, oversees six motorized launch sites um, with an additional paddlecraft park, which is strictly non-motorized. So all total, we have seven access points. For your information, just kind of hold this in the back of your head. Of those 200 permits that we issued for commercial use, I want to make you aware that you have a total of 620 parking spaces available for commercial vendors as well as the public across the seven sites. So obviously commercial vendors want access to the public boat ramps and our public want access to our public boat ramps. Um, and we have a very limited number of space um, as well as access points and parking sites. Uh, Parks and Recreation engaged your commercial boat launch permit holders uh, back in January. Uh, we wanted to hear directly from them, give them a voice to let us know their concerns, what worked, what didn't work, um, what their business model was. Um, we just really wanted to get to know our commercial boat launch permit holders. So we launched a survey. That survey is still currently active. Um, and we're still having it open for at least another week to try to solicit as much information as we can at this point in time. Once we solicit that information, uh, we're going to start analyzing and seeing where, where we can make some adjustments. Uh, the original management plan that was approved back in 2021, Parks and Recreation staff will be bringing that back to you with further recommendations. Uh, we do need to clarify some language that's contained within our commercial boat launch permit policy. Um, a permit means different things to different people. Uh, so we need to clarify some things. We need to take a look at um, the number of sites that we have. We need to look at the limited parking that we have available and see if we can't better balance the use between commercial and public. So I just wanted to kind of brief you where we are, where we started for our two new commissioners, um, and that we are midstream. Uh, your Parks and Recreation Division is midstream in looking at the management plan as well as our current policy, and we will be bringing back um, recommendations uh, for possible adjustment, um, and we'll see what, okay. what direction you give us. Commissioner McDaniel. Just a quick question. Uh, do you need direction from this board to go forth and persevere to find other locations for public ramps? Um, I'm going to ask the county manager for direction on that. Would we need direction from the board to look for additional sites? Well, because what I heard out of you was a synopsis of what we have, a shortfall mm -hmm. of what we have with regard to what we have, and no plan for other than asking the people that we're already theoretically underserving, well, what do they want us to do? And so um, I'm thinking you, the, the forefront needs to be additional ramp sites for both motorized and non-motorized vehicles. Commissioners, we've had um, standing direction probably since the mid-2000s to bring opportunities to the board as they become available for boat, both beach and boat access. Um, Mr. Rodriguez just confirmed that last year that direction was, was reconfirmed to us. So okay. Okay. we'll continue to explore those opportunities as they become available, however rare that may be. I thought, I, thought, I thought that we had. That's the reason I was asking, but I didn't hear that as part of your process as to what we're doing. So I'd, I'd like that to get escalated in the staff's eyes as well our eyes and ears that are out amongst our community. Thank you, Commissioner, for that clarification. Yes. 
I mean, I look forward to the recommendations. One of the things I think we're really going to seriously need to consider, and I'm not saying it's the answer, but it definitely should be on the short list, is when you look at all the different um, marinas, you know, some are used more than others. We had, we had talked about having marina-specific stickers because it's hard to really know who uses what. We hand these things out, and we say, oh, we gave out 400 stickers, and then what we don't realize is 399 of them are going to Caxambas, and then we're like, oh, crap, um, oh, darn. Trust, restrict that from the record. Um, that's hard to do, but I really think we've got to do something hard to do in the next iteration. You know, we, 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 we're seeing what's happening at all the marinas, and it's not just Cac Sambas. I mean, Goodland, you know, it just so happens that a lot of them are in uh, my district, but all the beaches, all the marinas are becoming much more popular. Um, give us a little, like, I have a little bit of a, of a peek under the tent, but for the rest of us, talk about that big meeting that you all had at the, um, at the, at the, at the, at the was it North Collier Park, where you invited all the businesses, and, and it was more successful than I, I thought. I thought it was going to be World War III, but just give us a short version of who came, what you said, what happened, and the feedback you're hearing. Uh, Monday evening, January the 30th, we had an open uh, public meeting for all commercial boat launch permit holders. We had over 90 people in attendance that evening at North Collier Regional Park. Um, Deputy County Manager Rodriguez was in attendance as well as park staff. Dan Smith from the city of Marco was also in attendance and assisted. Uh, we gave them a very good, we gave them basically an overview of, of the damage that all of our marina sites um, sustained during Hurricane Irma. We briefed them on our recovery efforts and where we were in those efforts. Um, and then we basically opened the floor um, to hear from them. Um, it was a guided uh, open discussion about what they felt the county was uh, doing right in offering commercial boat launch permits uh, for purchase, um, where we had areas for improvement. Uh, we heard from a wide range of business models, from uh, commercial captains to ecotourism, um, and believe it or not, we were even able to um, hear from people that were using our sites without an actual permit. Um, so the trust factor uh, was actually to the point that it was heightened. And, um, so we got, I, what I feel, we got very good, uh, uh, good information and good factual information from the people in attendance that night. Um, so uh, I think that that really opened uh, their trust in us and wanting to actively hear from them. Uh, we did not sugarcoat anything. Uh, we let them know that we were just here to listen. Uh, that there would be recommendations coming back. Uh, I go back to the original uh, intent that back in 2021, we have a management plan. The word management is in there. So that means that we have to be diligent in managing uh, access to these limited number of sites that we have. So thank you for, for <laughs> bringing that up, Commissioner LaCostra. Yeah, and obviously the, that feedback you got will be part of what you work into your algorithm for recommendations to us. Yes. Anybody have any other questions? Thank you for the update. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to 10B. Yes, sir. And Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, we're going to need to continue that until the next meeting. The, uh, I think March 14th is the next meeting. Um, we're still waiting to get some information back from the state agency that's drafting the agreements. So I'd like to make a motion to continue that until March 14th. Okay, second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, continue it unanimously. What else? That brings us to item 15C, staff and commission general communications. Uh, we have two updates. We'll start with Mr. Rodriguez with, uh, with his update. This is for actually uh, District 1. Uh, for the record, Dan Rodriguez, your Deputy County Manager. Um, as you know, Barefoot Beach Preserve and Barefoot Beach Access, two different parks, uh, receive substantial damage in North Collier County. Uh, this week, as a matter of fact, uh, Parks and Recreation. Not District 1. So you got District 1 in the Sorry. brain. I know, I yeah. do. <laughs> but you know, I, like, I respect that. I respect that. That's right. Stay on District 1. Give it to him. <laughs> Commissioner Locastro will start, start to take over here. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's all. It's all I absorbed Pelican Bay. It's all District 1. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Feels like it. So the good news is Barefoot Beach Access actually opens. Is it um, March 4th? 4th? Yep. 
the 4th. So a lot of work by facilities management as well as your parks and recreation staff and some of our contractors. So uh, that's the first beach access in North Collier County. We're still working on Barefoot Beach Preserve. Substantial damage there. All of the boardwalks were uh, pretty much destroyed as well as the uh, stairs going into the bathhouse and some work there. Uh, but staff is working on that. Uh, we have cleaned out the parking lots and whatnot. So uh, you'll see a phased approach at Barefoot Beach. As soon as we get an updated schedule, uh, we'll keep the commissioners informed. Thank you. Uh, we also have a meeting this week with the city of Naples regarding the beach permit uh, parking issue. Uh, we talked about that last meeting. So we are meeting with the city manager and, and his staff this week to, um, to go over some of those details and look forward to um, not only getting Commissioner McDaniel and Mayor Heitman back together, oh. but um, also bringing some information back to the board. Woke me from my nap. Okay. <laughs> and that's all we have to the county attorney. Uh, nothing. Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Cole. Um, I'm good. Okay. Commissioner Hall. Can we talk to his wife? I've got something I just need y'all to bear with me with. So we all know on December the 20th, I had my first AHAC meeting. Commissioner LeCastro had been in there for the last two years. And I campaigned hard on workforce housing and getting this off the ground. It's been talked about forever. So I've been to three meetings, three of the AHAC meetings, and uh, I, I was clear on day one that I didn't want to hang around and just talk about things. I wanted to get things done. So the current, um, the current chair that's leading the, the committee He's, they've, in a year's time that he's been the chair, he's brought forth two things. One was the landlord thing that we turned around. It had nothing to do with workforce housing or adding affordable housing. The second one, he brought forth four initiatives that uh, got postponed through the summer, got postponed because of the election coming, and then it, uh, it looks like we're going we're gonna to get to bring that forth on uh, the 28th of March in that, in that meeting. But those are the only two things that he's done. And uh, he's, I've seen 12 different articles, and tw either articles or interviews in the media, and every one of them are pandering to the crisis. You know, it, it was a problem, then it's a crisis, then it's overwhelming, we're not gonna have, you know, it keeps getting worse and it keeps getting worse. And so it's obvious that um, He's good at building the problem, but he's not, he hadn't done anything to bring forth anything solution-wise. And the advisory, the mission of the advisory committee is to review and recommend policies, procedures, ordinances, look at incentives, um, look at the comp plan, and bring back to us ideas that we can either implement or not implement. And so I, I haven't seen that committee acting in that capacity. And so I know that the more that you focus on the problem, the bigger the problem gets. The more you focus on the solutions of things, the bigger sol the solution gets. I also know that the speed of the group is determined by the speed of the leader. And so I think uh, prior to my, maybe one meeting prior to me getting there in November, uh, they brought the staff into the meeting and we've got growth management, we've got planning and zoning, We've got development review. We've got um, economic development and housing representatives. All senior staff are there. And things started progressing from there. We, we have established a surtax committee. We got $20 million. How do we spend it? So we've established that surtax committee that's met once. It's going to meet again this month for the second time. And we have a pretty good, pretty good plan to bring forth to us how to spend that money. So... I'll, we need someone that's leading that group that's not um, more focused on getting in the media and building the problem. And we need someone that's results oriented and that's not, doesn't want to build a platform based on their position. And for that reason, I'm going to make a motion to remove the current chair from the committee and. Uh, and let us find someone that's that's got. Uh, I think we have some people on that committee that can fill that seat pretty good. 
I've talked to the county attorney, executive, executive order, or executive summary is not required here. It's just between us. We have the power to, to do it or not to do it. Frustrations I had, the, and, and we did make quite a bit of progress there because, I mean, I can tell you prior, the, the person that was the commissioner chair prior to me had, had the worst attendance record of anybody there. So that, like you said, I, I like what you say when you say, you know, you lead from, from the front. But one of the things that I, I, I got frustrated with quite a bit in that meeting. You know, we, we talk about everybody screaming, we want a workshop, right, for affordable housing. We want a workshop for Parks and Rec. We want a workshop. And what we always say is, you know, bring us the plan first before we just sort of book a date and we're all in here sort of just chit-chatting and with no homework assignments and no anything. You know, I recommended so strongly, great, go to the county ma the county manager, and when she says they're ready for prime time, you're not going to pull, pull us all together to tell us stuff we already know. Um, and you know, and, and, and those things sort of, you know, lallygagged uh, a bit. Um, I guess I need some, um, some, I guess we all do from the county attorney, what, what is the, the process, if that's something we want to support or entertain, or I see, and I see Commissioner Saunders lit up. Let me go to Commissioner Saunders first, and then Mr. Klatskow, let's hear from you. Clearly, and I'm sure Mr. Klatskow is going to say, clearly we have the authority to put people on a committee and take them off. That's, that's w without question. Uh, Commissioner Hall is our representative to this committee. Uh, he campaigned on helping to develop workforce and affordable housing. Uh, you've had work experience in that, in that arena, and I'm gonna follow your lead. So I'm gonna second your motion. Uh, well, I hate to see somebody removed from a committee that's, that's been a volunteer, but you're the guy that now is focusing on, on that, and I'm gonna follow your, your recommendation. Now, um, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna second the motion. Thank you. Commissioner McDaniel. Have you talked to him about this yet? I have not. Uh, Commissioner Castro has talked to him numerous times about it, and I was going to talk to him until I found out that, that he's had multiple conversations with him, and I thought, you know what, there's no sense in saying anything else to yeah. him. Yeah, and, and, and I'll clarify. So my conversations with him were... Yeah, I'm, I'm not done. Okay. If I can. All right. No, go ahead. I, I just... Okay. I, I just... You, you reiterated the mission of the of the of the committee its duties its responsibilities and now if it's already been told him and he that hasn't been following then if that's the follow-up that you were just about to say then i I'll, i was going to second the motion because i remember having a conversation with him myself and i said bring me a deal bring me a deal said it over and over bring me a deal and nothing yeah. so you know, and, and the conversations I had is, you know, when I would see, you know, letters to the editor in the paper, which which is which is any citizen's right. So it's not like that's the smoking gun or anything. But, you know, the disappointment is, wow, I like everything that you wrote to the editor. I would have liked that to have been um, a meeting that you had with the county manager or something that you had with the with the chairperson. You know, you're, you're, you know, you're writing letters in other publications sort of reiterating the problem. But, you know, um, we, we already know that. So I am, um, you know, I think, you know, some fresh blood, new direction. I mean, certainly, you know, one of the reasons why we we were very supportive of you bringing that to the uh, to the AHAC was not just because you campaigned on it, but your knowledge and and um, mixing things up a little bit. And there are some really great people on that committee, but I don't, you know, I don't know that it helps the community. And you know, and there's been other people that have done similar things where they've written things in the paper saying we're a bunch of greedy commissioners and this and that. And I don't know that that really helps the, the process. And so not like we're looking for a yes man or, or a yes woman, but you know, if you have this great passion and these complaints, um, you know, voice it to the right folks because anything else is sort of working against the process and not, not making us um, focus Focused any any more efficiently on the problem just for the public's the 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 comments and the the mantra of his articles is that we don't care mm -hmm. we don't even we we have we don't even care there's not one of us up here that doesn't doesn't care deeply about this issue and it's I've always said it's a private sector solution we can get out of the way mm -hmm. but bring us deals let us look at some things where we can we can make some some decisions whether whether positive or whether negative and uh, but it seems to be like we don't care other counties in the state they've they've all got this handled call your counties lagging behind because of the care factor and I just I just don't want to deal with that I think that has merit um, so just for clarification if we have a motion in a second if we approve this then is the next step when you go to the, your next day hack meeting then you have a discussion with the folks that are there elect I'll a new chairperson right 
Yeah, obviously, and contact him. But then at your, you'll, you'll come here at the next meeting and say, we've elected Mr. or Mrs. Smith, yes. that kind of thing, right? I can do that. Okay. County attorney, do you have anything to add? No, three votes. Okay, so we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Anything else, sir? I would like to mention, uh, I think uh, Louise may have sent everybody a Senate Bill 102. There are some really, really great things in this bill, but there's some, there's some lines in that bill that, uh, that just didn't set right with me, and it has to do with taking the authority that we have as a local governing body to make some decisions. And it's lines, I want to say it's lines 302 to lines 345, somewhere in there. So you don't have to sit there and read the whole thing, but those are the critical lines if you just would uh, take a look at that. Because when we go to Tallahassee, I would like to address that to Senator Pasadomo because this is her baby. Okay. That's all. Commissioner McDaniel. Yes. I, uh, bear with me one second here. Um, my uh, my first, I'd like I'd like to, speaking of conservation, Collier, um, with the governor's initiative for uh, moving, moving Florida forward and and a huge amount of money being appropriated into transportation, it's been a well known fact of uh, the intersection of Everglades Boulevard and I seventy five getting to be opened up as a partial interchange, and the and the thought that I had was. Uh, in uh, giving staff direction and, and establishing a, a target protection zone on the north side of that intersection up Everglades Boulevard for at least a half a mile. Um, there, is, uh, there are movements afoot for the four laning of Everglades Boulevard from Oil Well down to Golden Gate Boulevard, the extension of Vanderbilt Beach out to Everglades Boulevard and with that activity we'll be able to hold that south end of Everglades Boulevard to a low speed two lane neighborhood road and still be able to handle the traffic but one of the concerns back in 2010-2012 when that intersection was proposed uh, there were two main issues um, one is you can't supplement your lack of an internal grid system by utilization of a federal highway. It's counterintuitive to me, but that's their role. And then the other is Commercial Creek that comes along with the opening of an interchange. And with Conservation Collier's acquisition, we acquisitions or capacities of, we, for, we put off uh, a, a lot of the concerns with regard to the commercial creep that might come in that area if I am successful in getting the Federal Department of Transportation to authorize the opening up of that intersection as a partial interchange. So before I went through the motions of an executive summary and all that to, to establish that target protection zone, I just I wanted to run it ahead and run it in front of you and get the positive head nods and then move forward with that as, a, as an area that the, the conservation collier could look at just from an environmental standpoint, from a habitat standpoint, huge corridor of travel out of the Panther Preserve over into the North Belmede. We don't have the <coughs> capacity of any wildlife crossings on Everglades Boulevard. It's just, it's, it's, it's fiscally infeasible. We can't put fences up in front of people's houses and manage the, the critters to the hole that would be put up underneath the road. So. Um, I'd like to go forward and pursue that target protect protection zone if, if in fact, it meets with y'all's approval. Um, Dr. George, I received a phone call today from uh, Mayor Grimms. Um, Everglades City's in tight. As you know, we have a failing, or not a failing, we have a, a wastewater system in Everglades City that is in the process of being upgraded. They've been, Everglades City is in, in, in close to $10 million to, <coughs> to redo their wastewater plant. And I got a call from Howie today. And I know Dr. George has been in communication with them when they were doing their permitting and, and that we would back them up, but um, they're needing to be backed up. And I just wanna make sure that we authorize the county manager as she leaves <laughs> to uh, uh, support Dr. George and his team 
for whatever is requisite for Everglades City to be able to make sure their wastewater and, and their affluents that are coming off that plant are properly managed. You good with that? Okay, I got a thumbs up out of Dr. George. Um, th this item is a circumstance that's, uh, this is a, a new item that's been going on for quite some time. Um, I'm getting a lot of conflicting information from our staff, code enforcement. Uh, I didn't talk to our county attorney about it yesterday and the sheriff's office with regard to panhandling in our community. It's a issue and I'm being told uh, what I would like to do is uh, bring an agenda item forward with a proposition of some recommended adjustments to our ordinance with regard to panhandling to enhance our sheriff's capacity to better enforce and protect our citizens. So I got positive head nods on that. I'm, I'm like hitting on all cylinders. Um, Let me just ask you a question. So we did pass an ordinance and, and did. I remember the sheriff saying, you know, it's not illegal to walk through a public's parking lot and ask somebody for money. So there were some things that I think we were all hoping we could put in that organ ordinance that we didn't or couldn't. Do you, you feel like you've, you, we, that thing's been sitting out there long enough and, and not 100% effective that you've got some things that sure. we definitely can yes. beef it up? Excellent. Right. Yeah. Terry hates it when we both talk at the same time. So <laughs> the, uh, uh, the sheriff's uh, folks that I've been talking to have found the holes think they know how to fix the holes and I'd like to make the adoption or adaptation to the existing ordinance to help them help us and in coordination with our county attorney as well so I don't get too far down the road um, is the burn ban in effect county manager no not yet we haven't hit the re required index yet um, we, it, it, as, you, as you all know, it's past time for one to be in place. Um, it's, uh, there, there's a myriad of matrix that has the calculations that have to go through, humidity and rainfall, blah, and a bunch of people that have to okay it. But it, it, and I'm not, a, I'm not a proponent of banning anything, but that's one that has actually worked and had positive effects in our community, and the better, the sooner we institute it, uh, the better off we're in fact going to be. I think we did authorize the county manager upon the all the boxes getting checked, you can enact it. Yes. Okay. Um, how close would it be? How close would what be, sir? The burn ban. It's, it, do you have a timeline? Based on the uh, history, it, we're still about 30 days out dryness the dry index as well as the winds and whatnot in coordination with the state forestry and state emergency officials I, I know with communication with Greater Naples they've already responded to two flare-ups and if it weren't ones. for you know I, I, and you know when we're talking about budgetary constraints and requests if the if the sheriff wants to buy another Huey I'm gonna tell him to get two uh, that thing is invaluable to our fire set our fire departments for protecting our community because it take the forestry department has a Huey and that's the one that's equipped to carry the big water bucket and put extinguish the fires and it takes two hours for the forestry department's unit to get here and that fire's already lit and burning and virtually out of control and our, our sheriff's been able to be on them like that and contain them into relatively speed and so far no property and certainly no life has been lost but the sooner we take a proactive step and get that burn ban in place until, I mean, it's only going to be for a couple of months where we, 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 as soon as it starts to rain on a regular basis, we lift the ban and let people uh, take care of their yard waste. But there's so many people in Eastern Collier County now that they're, they're coming in flocks of, of people in, in Eastern Golden Gate Estates. And after Ian, there was an enorm enormous amount of yard debris that that they're that they're wanting to get rid of so that's that's all i got for now commissioner saunders i have an item that's not at all controversial <laughs> okay we'll see I, I have a little bit of a fear in even bringing this up but um we canceled the uh, the grant with the cdc for the migrant uh, health care program and we all had uh, problems with with uh, certain aspects of that grant but i think we were all in agreement that the 
general health care that was being provided in the migrant community was something of value. And uh, I understand that that program is going to continue for a couple of months. Uh, there's some uh, other funding that is being used for that. I didn't know if the commission would have any interest in exploring whether we want to fund uh, the continuation of that type of a program uh, for the, the community that's being served. And the, the, you know, if the answer is no, then that's fine, but I just thought mm -hmm. I'd bring it up to see. We, we canceled the grant because of certain uh, requirements in the uh, CDC grant. Uh, we, eliminate, we, if we eliminate all that uh, and just simply have the health care program continue, uh, I guess the issue is do we want our staff to come back and let us know what something like that might look like? Commissioner McDaniel. The answer is yes. I'd like to explore that. It, it, if nothing else, uh, you know, uh, yes. If nothing else, we're going to learn. We're going to be able to, uh, if, if in fact we do, the, the county does decide to continue with some uh, assistance there. Um, we're going to be able to put measurables and milestones in. We're going to have, be able to have trackable information, which we weren't necessarily having in advance of this. Um, and, I, and I think uh, there's no argument that the healthcare network does an amazing job for our community. They're the largest provider of Medicaid services in the entire county, um, and they do service that community and service it extremely well. So I, I'd be I'd be wholeheartedly interested in seeing how we could do that. Anybody else? Uh, yep, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I, I thought at some point in the language we said we were going to try to seek other sources at so the, some point when we voted that day. But. Right, so the direction would be for the county to meet with the health care network, come back to us with some uh, potential recommendations on how we might continue the program without the uh, CDC type of uh, <laughs> requirements, obviously. Non-COVID related. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. It, and you know, because when, when when the day before that meeting that we actually extinguished that grant, I was the, I was actually pinged by our I'm pointing at our clerk uh, I, because we we have regulations on where we can pull money and what we can and can't do with it, and and we have to we have to be aware of that. But staff can give us that report, and then we can make some decisions as to how, when, and where, and what we do. Understood. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Okay. So I will end it on three very controversial things. No, they're not. Um, first, I just want to say um, on March 8th, all five commissioners up here will be joining Mr. Mullins up in Tallahassee. And um, just personally, you know, whether I'm chair or not, just how impressed I am that all five of us are going to be making a trek up to Tallahassee. So, Ty, or, um, sorry? He, he told you. On the 8th. No, no. He told you the 8th. We're all meeting them on the 7th. <laughs> okay. Yeah. They're, they're, always, they're always messing with me. Meeting there on the um, 6th or the meetings on the 7th. I'm going to be out there just hanging out by myself. We'll but. see you on Thursday <laughs> of that week. I'll be on my way hey, listen. Listen. Who's got the floor here? Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm giving you a positive shout out. So how disappointed I am that I have to join these four knuckleheads. Um, no, I, I just wanted to say just personally as a citizen, just how proud I am that all five of us are going to be up there showing the Collier County flag. Mr. Mullins is going to take us around and, you know, sometimes even a, a five or 10 minute meeting, even if it's just shaking hands and putting, you know, um, a name with a face of some key people, it's a big deal. And, and I burned a bit of shoe leather up in Tallahassee, probably obviously not as much as Commissioner Saunders, but it's it's valuable just, pr just to have presence. And then we have such a, a, a good team that's up there that it will be you know, very valuable. And you know, we're not going to have three hour meetings maybe on affordable housing, but at times you, you might meet the key person for the follow up call. So you know, we'll be front and center on whatever. John, give me the correct date. Make sure I'm not set up here. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't mean to come up here about you. Um, so I just wanted to say how. how I, I don't, I don't know the last time all five went up there. The last time I went, it was just three of us, and um, I'm, I'm proud that all five of us are going, and, and there's a lot of uh, merit to it, especially with the state-funded Veterans Nursing Home. We want to keep that on the front burner, and there's lots of other things, too. And if we get to pop in and see Senator Pasadomo, but I'm sure she'll be impressed that all five of us are there, and um, that'll be great. Um, the thing that I'm working on with Mr. Kladskow, similar, you know, you talk about the, we've let the panhandling ordinance sort of um, simmer a bit, and now we, we see where there's some holes. And where I've, I've had some, some issues, but I wanted to be educated on it first before I brought some 
something to you all um, that I hope you will support, and we're working on it, and it has to do with the collection of fines. You know, there's two things that, that, that bother me. Um, so 11A was, an, was not a great example, but it did shine a light on something, but I'll give you a, a better example. So someone owns a piece of property, it has $500,000 worth of fines, it has liens on it, it has all the bad stuff on it. They sell it to somebody and they sell it to that person as a discount because they go, wink, wink, you're, you're assuming all the liens and fines and everything. And then 30, 60, 90 days later, whenever it is, that person comes to the county. And at times we have had the precedent of being very um, generous in um, significantly lowering um, the, uh, the fine and, and, and all the, the bad stuff that, that goes with it. The person uh, that I have appointed um, to the, um, the code enforcement board has said at times, and I've watched code enforcement, they seem very quick to take a very high fine and rather than maybe in slow increments and figure out you know, what, what we can get, um, at times it, it defaults to zero uh, very quickly. Um, and, and that example is somebody that has a fine they're accruing a thousand dollars a day in fines for two years it's a huge number they finally build the wall plant the tree pick up the rock whatever the issue is so they're quote in compliance and then that you know multi six-figure fine at times either goes away or gets reduced significantly what i would like to see us do because the feedback i've gotten from people that are on the code enforcement board and even you know folks on the staff um, uh, miss patterson and i have talked about it a bit is that we might need to blow the dust off and, and send a um just a, a renewed message to the code enforcement board and to some people on our staff that that our, our going in position isn't default to zero and then work up from there. But our default position is, remember, this isn't county money. This is taxpayer dollars. And so when, the, when that money comes back to the county, that's money that can be used in, in other areas. So it's not so much, oh, it's, not, it's not changing the ordinance, you know, to Mr. Klatskow's uh, point. He was talking about it's just a resolution, sort of an add-on that just reconfirms, hey, if a fine is a certain amount, and the example I always use is we're not trying to trace the old retired couple who have been in the hospital for a month and didn't mow their lawn. Um, you know, it got taken care of. We let it go. But there's some fines out there that are significant that I think too quickly get sort of dumbed down to a very small amount. And then, you know, there's some people on the board that have relayed to me, well, that's the guidance we kind of get. That's what, you know, hey, they're, they're in compliance. So um, we're working on something that we're going to bring here and see if you're satisfied with it. So I just wanted to plant the seed. And the reason I wanted to also do that is be thinking about that so we can have a really um, good discussion and, and come up with something that is an improvement or maybe we we just leave it alone and it's more of just a verbal type thing through the county manager to the powers that be but i think we're 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 um we're losing out on on collecting things that you know people that aren't following code and 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 the law and whatnot um should be bringing back and that's real money um you know we've sat here for hours talking about ten thousand dollars yet somebody had a five hundred thousand dollar fine it got it got uh, lowered to ten grand they walked out the door and then it, that, that was four hundred and ninety thousand dollars of christmas money that we just we just gave them and that's not county money so um i think the next meeting we're going to have something we've been working on it for we, we actually have been talking but the time to bring it wasn't during the isles of capri marathon meeting or you know during the um david lawrence center we wanted to sort of pick and choose when the timing would be right so it sounds like maybe at the next meeting or or um, sooner than later we'll be talking about maybe a couple of ordinances that we can improve on and then lastly um, I think recognition is extremely important I think we all do um, it, you know um, Dan will, will, will agree with me in the military it's a really big deal you know sometimes you might give somebody something that only has um, uh, minimal value but it has maximum appreciation so I wanted to take the time to end on a positive note and um, I wanted Alima Edwards to come come forward up here so she's nervous she can't speak in front of a group but um, I'm gonna just tell you what a superstar Alima is um, if you're in charge of Parks and Rec right now you have one of the toughest jobs on the staff because you can't do it fast enough for the citizens you can't do it good enough everybody you know we've got people that peer over a locked gate at Caxambus and are smarter than us and tell us we're all stupid and they, they must have x-ray vision because they can't see the damage but you know they want it they just want the gate unlocked and she has just been doing such an incredible job at Tiger Tail um, Caxambus and and the other areas she's not a, a district one parks and, and rec person although it feels like you are right um, the amount of emails that she gets from citizens are always 
they're first of all, some of them are just rude and vulgar because I get CC'd on them or I get it and then I, I run interference. But I just wanted to say like how proud I am of how you serve this county, how you how you, your replies to citizens that send you emails that are horrific. Um, how you replied just recently to somebody about, you know, something that was broken at Tiger Tail and your your reply is something that you know, represents the county just with such polish and, and professionalism. So on those days when you get those emails and people are screaming and yelling at you and telling you that, you know, you're dumb and I'm dumb and nobody's doing anything and the county doesn't care and, you know, we don't, you know, we're all we're all a bunch of, of greedy people with our hands in, in the pockets of, you know, developers or business people that have, own jet ski companies. Um, you're doing a fantastic job. You know, I just want to tell you that. Your sense of urgency to go to go back to citizens and, and me as well with the, with the right answer and and to jump on it and the follow-up um, you know you are you're you're in the right place at the right time and we're damn lucky to have you so I'm gonna put my Colonel LeCastro hat on now and if I was Colonel LeCastro you know anybody that's been in my office sees that I got a I got a whole pot of what we call challenge coins and those are in the military are given out for excellence and when I was a commander I had my own coin at the Air Force Academy I had my own coin at Andrews Air Force Base and I had my own coin at Eglin Air Force Base all three places where I was a senior base commander and I don't have many of those coins left, but I kept a few. And if you would come up here forward, I want to give you a, a coin that's an Air Force One coin. And when, um, when I was a senior commander um, responsible for a lot of important things for Air Force One, and people would help us, and we used to say, if you, if you help me, you're helping the President of the United States. These coins don't even exist anymore because they get changed out you know, from every commander. But on behalf of the United States of America and the President of the United States and Colonel Rick LeCastro, I just want to give you this coin. and it, it represents the great work and the leadership that you do for our county every day that oftentimes goes unrecognized and unappreciated. On behalf of all five commissioners here, we do appreciate it. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> now you got to keep it with you at the bar. You know what I'm really mm -hmm. happy about? I thought he was going to make a chair Chairman LeCastro coin. <laughs> He's working on it. Okay, and with that said, meeting adjourned. Thank you. It's but a game and they let it slip away. Love like the autumn